but there's two things that I always think about, right? There's the uncanny valley, like where does that fear come from? And also the, the, the fear of technology. Like as soon as our tech got to a certain point, humans automatically jumped to the conclusion that one day our technology would cause all these types of things like the, the uncanny valley, you know, problems mm-hmm. and, and right. technology taking over and being dangerous for us and ruining humanity and all these other things. It's like, right. where does that, where does our fear of machinery and the uncanny valley stuff, where does that come from? Right. And, and it's, it's hard for me to jump to the, to, oh, it's only dead bodies. Like, like, I don't think that's the same thing. Yeah. Welcome back. This is I Came With Fire Podcast. We're here with Trent, uh, a self-proclaimed douche collector, which is a kind of a, a weird job title. I don't know how one gets that. Maybe you, you can explain. Uh, Trent has been on the podcast before, but not enough, in my opinion. It's been a while since you were on here last. That episode was fun. Some pretty good, some pretty good clips from that, making fun of Gen X, talking about really weird shit. Trent's a cool guy, though, for sure. Let's, uh, for, for everybody in the chat who doesn't know who you are, though, give some intros. Yeah, uh, Trent Segmiller, recently retired from the United States Air Force. How, how long can I still say recently? Is like the first year? Is I think the first year. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Oh, then I'm well within that window. Then for the official retirement, not the day that I stopped working, but official retirement. Right. Right, right, uh, right. Did some fun stuff in the Air Force. I'm uh, one of the co-hosts of the One's Ready podcast, where we try to give information about you know air force special warfare stuff and it's uh try to be fun but try to be serious and help folks out uh, but i'm excited to be here so we can talk about some fun stuff is, is this is going to be a fun one for real did I, I remember a long time ago before i even had a podcast and was listening to y'all's podcast you were talking about what people for sr you were looking for like the qualities in those people and you said you guys were looking for the nerd that won't quit and that you said that, and that kind of has stuck. Like I've remember, remembered that in my brain because I was like, the nerd that won't quit. That's fucking awesome. But you are definitely a nerd that won't quit. I think you were like <laughs> describing yourself. Like, what, what kind of person are we looking for? We're actually looking for the me archetype. That's who we're looking for. It's one of the big traps, right? Is trying to um, uh, see yourself in students, though. And you see that all the time. And not to, to yeah. do like a, a one's ready episode or whatever, but like no, no, one of the traps of, of being, a, I think, a teacher is is trying to recreate yourself and your experiences and all that other stuff so um i think part of that was me talking about me but also a you know fair bit of observation yeah no doubt dude you, that's a it's definitely one of the jobs in special warfare that i mean i really don't even know a lot about like everybody knows kind of about uh you know pararescue and combat control but you know in the air force academy only recognizes combat control apparently Oh, that ruffled some feathers over there. But um, anyway, little inside baseball joke there. I see the sad face going on. They lost in those uniforms pretty handily to Army, so they got what they deserve, I guess. Uh, you know, yeah, they couldn't this, even that play was well. The that, was, that, that was the worst part. Is you know they kind of jacked up the whole thing. You know, they're like, oh, we're doing AFSOC, and then they only did combat control, right. and then they tried to you know do the the damage control messaging afterwards. Like, no, we we have everybody involved, and it's like, but but you don't. <laughs> You, and and everybody would have been fine if you just would have said, this is a combat control uniform. And we all sure. would have been stoked about it. But don't. Right. Just don't they're me. showing their ignorance. And, and I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. No. Super inside baseball. But I just had to throw it out there, you know. Thanks. Buddy. But uh, when, uh, you're welcome. You're still special to me. The nerd that won't quit. And also a douche collector, apparently. So, uh, But I'm Buttercup the Sacred Clown. I don't think I've ever given the explanation on why I, I have that nickname, but there's a very real story behind that one. So because you chose douche collector and it's, you're somebody who just chose a fun nickname, I'm going to explain why I've got buttercup, the sacred clown on here. So a while back, somebody in our, our little circle who, you know, introduced me to somebody, me and a few other people to somebody, um, I won't say their name, but they're a political person, uh, working for a certain political party. And, um, this person got on the phone with me. We had this conversation, essentially trying to like help out for uh, voting, like to get people to register to vote, right? And then they called Chris, right? After blowing Chris off uh, for like a day, basically, and then described me and then a few other people 
um, me as a buttercup and then somebody else as something else. I don't remember what it was, but essentially that they were like sucking Chris's dick a little bit about being a green beret. It was super weird. And so Chris immediately called me and was like, bro, he's like, I just had the weirdest conversation with this loser. He's like, I have no idea why he thought, you know, he could just get on the phone and like make fun of our friend group. It was really weird. And um, so anyway, I have I have since embraced the nickname Buttercup um, privately and I put it on here. And uh, the sacred clown thing comes from the concept of the uh, Native American sacred clown or like the Hayoka who can like the court jester poke fun at everything that's going on and mm-hmm. uh, sort of has the, the leeway to just make fun of the king, so to speak, and can get away with it. And so that's it, man. Buttercup, the sacred clown. And uh, that's how that was born. But uh, anyway, a little bit of useless information. Do you know what a lot of people are missing these days? Is the sacred Humility? clown. The straight shooter. Oh. In, their, in their circle of, of advisors and, and mm-hmm. co-workers and people that work for them. I think and, every uh, squadron commander should have a sacred clown. Dude, I, what? And, I, at least every group wing NAF MAGICOM commander should, because those are the people that really get disconnected. It it should be an E4 too. Like it's got to be, you know. Or an E6. Or an know? E6. Right. But, the crusty, angry tech sergeant who who could do it. Yeah, that's it. You know what? It could be a team of sacred clowns. An yes. E6 and then an E4. Right. The leader of the E4 mafia and then the crustiest E6. That's that's who should be. I like that. There it is. I don't know if you still have connects, man, but you need to let people know they're at the upper echelons of the Air Force that that needs to happen. So you guys probably have more important years than I ever would over there. But, uh, yeah. Doing our best to get rid of them. I, we, yeah. <laughs> are you guys the sacred clowns? I think you guys are the sacred clowns. Sometimes. I mean, you know, like... We we got our bugaboos, right? The yeah. the the fat people, the the hypocrisy, always all the other things. Like we'll say, we want to say good things, right? If if someone in a leadership position, right, in the military writ large, does something amazing, I want to be one of the first people to hop on the microphone and tell them that they are crushing it. Like I love right. positivity, right? But the rest of it, you just can't ignore it. It's you know, yeah. like well, what's going wrong with everything? How come recruiting sucks? How come people aren't listening to us? How come people aren't maintaining the standards? It's like, well, because mm-hmm. of you. Bro. Right. With with no, the stars some, on. Those are some serious questions that a lot of people don't want the answers to. Enter the sacred clowns. Enter the sacred clowns. Is. So, all right. We always like to get weird on here, and that's why I like when you come on, because I know you're willing to go places other people wouldn't. Um, not to make you sound too much like a, a corner corner princess, um, doing places other people wouldn't, you know. But um anyway. <laughs> Dude, so I went on. We talked the other day, like we were texting, and we were like, "Dude, what do we?" I was like, "What do we? What we should, should we talk about?" And you, you made a good point. You're like, "Let's not limit ourselves." So we won't limit ourselves. But I went on sort of a deep dive on something that I have always kind of wanted to know more about, um, and it is it is the person or entity or alien or whatever you want to call it uh, named Indrid Cold. Have you ever heard of Indrid Cold before? No. No. Good. Okay. We're gonna learn. We're going to learn together. As they say, the best way to learn is to teach. So, I mean, you should know that. You've been an instructor for a long time. And yeah. uh, we're going we're gonna to do this. So, Indrid Cold is tied into all of this, like, lore around, like, Mothman. Are you familiar? You've heard of Mothman, right? There was yes. that movie that Richard Gere did back in the day, Mothman Prophecies, which is based on a book by a dude named John Keel. And then John Keel wrote a bunch of other books. Um but one of the, I think, the more interesting things about at least Injured Cold and why I have always sort of been drawn to him is because of his, like, relationship with some of these other, like, beings that you hear about if you spend any sort of time, like, learning about the supernatural. So, like, Men in Black or, which I mean, you should know probably, uh, but, like, then you ever heard of Black Eyed Kids before? The the pictures, right? That people... Is that don't all people like the a group of people draw the same pictures of the black eyed kids or they all see them or something? Yeah, so there is there's like shared experiences like that, but then also the like black eyed kids. Um like the first story of it is this guy, and this was this actually was broke on like the internet way back in the day. And this is when you like you still had to like write checks to pay for shit, and then this guy so basically this dude was um 
in the parking lot writing a check for his internet service and he was going to drop it off at like their their like payment window at this like strip mall and basically he was like looking down at his checkbook these two kid two kids walked up to his window at his car and asked basically explained that they were there for a movie at the movie theater across the street and um that they were asked they had forgotten their money and they asked if he could give them a ride home to their mom to get the money so they could go see the movie. And the movie they were trying to see was Mortal Kombat, which had come out like several years ago. So this was like one of those like two dollar like, um, you know, movies back in the day. People used to yep. do that. And um, he thought that was kind of weird. And then he realized in the midst of the conversation that, A, he was way more afraid of these kids than he should be. And then he noticed that their eyes were black. Um, and then they kept pressuring him to let him them in the car. And one of the kids even said to um, him that it's okay, I don't have a gun, right? Which is sort of weird. Like if, if somebody says like, hey, can I get a ride? I don't have a gun. Like the first thought I'm going to have is you probably got a fucking gun. No, how and, him, You know, like yeah. – right? It's weird like that, that you think you had to say that. Right. It's not a very, uh, you know – subtle thing you're making or your point you're making saying you don't have a gun it doesn't put me at ease at all but that's what he says and then um he basically realizes that he's reaching for the the door lock to his car to like let them in and he doesn't even like he catches himself doing this and uh, so it's almost involuntary in a way and he gets freaked out and basically just throws his car in reverse in the middle of this like strip mall parking lot and just guns it in reverse not even like, and then kind of realizes halfway through gunning it in reverse that maybe he should have looked in his rear view mirror. <laughs> Didn't hit anybody, thank goodness. And um, but went to look back, and the kids were there for a second, but then they were gone when he went to look back again. And um, so he like put this online, and that's sort of like the first incident of like the whole black eyed kid thing as far as like modern pop culture goes right. but there are instances in like native american lore and other lore around the world about like black eyed entities um and there's a bunch of stuff that gets tied into like black eyed thing but they come up they they appear at people's doors they're like harbingers of uh, negativity or tragedy um, they appear as human but then the more you interact with them the more unhuman or something is off about them that you you can tell oftentimes they ask questions that don't really make a lot of sense um, like they'll ask like one of those the more popular stories about uh, black eyed kids is that they'll ask uh, they ask somebody if they could come in and use their telegram and uh, like coming like who the fuck no one uses that anymore you know or you know no one uses that technology anymore and um, they sometimes are dressed like really old and so there's this like notion that they can't appear to be too human and um, because it has to like it like levels the playing field essentially between like you and me as human beings and them as like interdimensional beings essentially who have the ability to manipulate you. But it would almost be unfair to um, take advantage of us that way without some sort of aid and being able to tell that the interaction you're having isn't with a genuine person. Does that make sense? Or their programming is coming from so far away. That even with whatever, it's Ooh. like light years away, right? Right. So if the programming comes back, you know, like the, the data has to go two ways. That's a good so point, actually. These kids are like, "Hey, can I can I use your Telegram?" And we're like, "Bro, that was a long time ago." But the people yeah, that yeah. are doing the programming way back in the back, and apparently, if the Mortal Kombat movie was only two years old, maybe it's getting better. That's true. That's actually a good idea. I've never thought about it that way. That maybe it is one of those things, like the whole time and space concept there where you're viewing earth from a, a distance where you're seeing things like in the 19th century you got like the pony pony express going on or whatever i don't know that's actually an interesting idea never thought about it that way because there there is this like idea in like the paranormal community about like trickster beings like this is what they call them and um that they can't really give you or can't manipulate you or control you uh, completely and totally. And the information they give you can't, won't always be perfect. Uh, the information they use to like convince you that something is the way it is. And there's mm -hmm. this uh, book out there I read. It's called um, Siren Call of Hungry Ghosts. And essentially, long story short, essentially this guy goes to this woman who's like a medium or whatever. And, uh, or she's a channeler. And 
his like spirit guide comes through and he the spirit guide is a female who says like we were lovers back in the day a couple hundred years ago you know it's me i've missed you and then gives him all this information that he can go verify and he does to sort of build trust with him and then as time goes on he realizes that not all of the information is accurate and it's not like oh you made a mistake about something it's like some of it is blatantly false and false in like a misleading way and then he starts to confront like this spirit he's talking to about why they're being dishonest and uh, it just gets angry basically like gaslighting him essentially and that's kind of like this again it's like this notion that the other side or the other dimension can't um, use their full ability on you. It has to be like fair leveling the playing field. Well, that's like the, uh, the over, uh, you know, crossover with like the satanic worshiping cult people, right? Like the theory is that they have to tell you, they have to give you signs and let you know that they are who they are and they're doing what they're doing. Right? Really? Yeah. Like that's, that. that's one of the big things is, is, you know, you can always tell when somebody crossed over and now they're like a Satan worshiper or whatever, because they, the, if they're like an artist, right, you start to see mm -hmm. it coming out in their, their artistry because they're, the, the theory is they are required to let you know mm -hmm. that this is what they are pushing now. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can ignore it or, or you can, you know, whatever. Oh, well, that's kind of interesting. I've never heard of that before. Like I know that I, and I've seen especially the last couple of years, even some of the people that I like served with have become Satanists. It's almost become like the whole fight club thing. Or if you're one of those people that does CrossFit, like the first rule of CrossFit club is you have to tell people that you do mm. CrossFit, you know, yep. it's like the exact opposite of fight club. So maybe there's like an element to that. I've never heard that about, about Satanists though, but, um, the, well, the wind is blowing like a motherfucker here. Side note for everybody. And um, we're talking about spooky shit, and it just blew on my window super hard that it, like, creaked. Totally freaked me out, threw me off my game here for a second. So bear with me. Spooky stuff. I'm home alone, too, uh, right now. It's going to be uh, one of those nights, bro. It's going to be one of those nights, dude. I better better not have a run-in with injured cold. But, no, I bring up I bring up the uh, Black Eyed Kids thing and all this stuff just to kind of say that, like, injured is one of those people that sort of exists in that sphere. And, um... The uh, Mothman prophecies and all that stuff, the, the book or the Mothman sightings tie into this completely and totally because the week essentially that those – so let's, let's set the scene here a little bit. 1966 is when this started happening for, the, for like the first time that we know of that it was documented. And the week that this happened to um, – so the person who saw injured cold most, most notably is a guy named Woodrow Derenberger. Um, but – this guy, John Keel, through the course of his investigation, realizes essentially that Woodrow's sighting isn't the first one because um, there, are, there was somebody else, two kids essentially, and a woman, an off-duty cop, and his wife, and two other police in Elizabeth, New Jersey, that same week who had um, an incident with a UFO, and then the woman, and then these two kids had an incident with uh, what what Keel would later you know, coin as the grinning man. And that's another like name for injured cold. Is this starting to sound familiar to you? Look yep. like you're like nodding your head. Yep. Yeah. So basically, basically what happened, um, I got some notes. I'm going to, I'm going to pull them up. So we can kind of be stick. professional and stuff about Dude, this. I'm going to be a professional and stuff, man. Yeah. I'm trying to not be too retarded sometimes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So this, uh, I, I can't help it. It's one. It's, it's like what we were talking about before. Like it, it's gonna come out that I'm retarded. I can't help it. My art, the what I talk about, all this stuff. Eventually, you realize I'm retarded. Um, but no. So the first sighting, 11 October 1966, which is um, a few, basically a few weeks prior to uh, Woodrow Derenberger's uh, run-in with Andrew Cold. Um, at 10 p.m. in Elizabeth, New Jersey, to an off-duty cop and his wife, they saw like this super bright white light um, ball of light flying across the sky, and then it disappeared essentially over the hills. And then about the same time that it went over the hill, two like on-duty patrolmen, police officers, saw the same thing. One of them described it as being so bright that it like affected his sight for the next 20 minutes. And so these two people you know, unknown, unbeknownst to one another, saw the same thing and reported it. 
and three of them just happen to be police officers. Now you can throw you know whatever amount of credibility you want to throw into that with cops. Probably a little bit more back in 1966 than today, um, but in the same town, uh, the same night, uh, a woman. Her name is this is a weird name, Mrs. James. I've never known a woman named James, but her name is James, like spelled just like you know a man. Nickname Jimmy Yanchitis Yanchitis. Mrs. James Yankitas, she was leaving uh, her place of employment and went into the parking lot. And there was a cylinder-shaped craft that had landed in the parking lot. She said that these two men got out, what humanoid-looking men got out, and uh, basically walked up to her and started speaking to her in what she described as a dialect of English, that it sounded like English but not quite English. Not like broken English, but that some of the words and phrases weren't English didn't sound like english right it's like just um, like landing in scotland and trying to speak with people it's like dude whoa. have you ever listened to somebody from wales talk dude <laughs> yeah. you look like it's not the same mean, it's not dude it's it's absolutely insane trying to talk to you weren't you stationed in england for a time no no aaron and jared okay. were aaron and jared, yeah yeah okay yeah no dude listening to a welshman is even if you're not maybe you have to be drunk to understand them that might be a thing you know I'm working it, on it. It might help. I don't know. But yeah. anyway, they asked her questions. They said, what is this place? What do you call this? Kind of pointing to like the objects around the parking lot. What do people do here? And where do people go here? And she said that this the last question, where do people go here, was sort of in reference to how like people get around where she's from. Um, the interesting part with this is that A, these two people, or humanoids, whatever you want to call them, spoke to her verbally and asked her these questions verbally. They had an actual conversation like you and I are having, whereas Indrid speaking to uh, Woodrow Derenberger, or he, his nickname is Woody, he spoke to him telepathically, right. but did tell him that he could speak to, that Woody could speak to Indrid either verbally or with his thoughts, but that Indrid was going to speak to him telepathically. Um, and the other thing is, too, the parallels here are that the qu sorts of questions that they asked her are very similar to the sorts of questions that Indrid asked Woody that night. Um, they pointed off in the distance and asked about the town, Parkersburg, West Virginia, off in the distance and said, what is that? And Woody explained that that's a town or a city. And then Indrid explained that where he's from, it's called a gathering. Indrid asked him, like, what do you do for work? All these certain things, right? Sort of weird. I see you smirking. What are you thinking about? No, is it? Yeah, I remember we talked about it a little bit last time. Is there's the, the 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 context of aliens? You know, like right. We all assume that they're like. It, it, anybody assumes that a capability means advanced, and advanced means that they would have a, an intrinsic understanding True. of of us, and that they would gather information like from some other thing. Like just because they can travel through space doesn't necessarily mean that they have the capability. To sit sure. out in our atmosphere and pull in the information and that that information would mean the same thing to them that it means to us mm -hmm. and it would translate into uh you know viable research for them to you know uh, right. meet any of the goals that they're trying to meet sorry that's it's it's always funny no. to me that we we have these ideas it's true because we all like when you listen to conversations people have about like aliens the assumption is that they are more technologically advanced than us and in ways when you I guess if you look at it through that lens, you can say, well, if you're able to travel either intergalactically or in an interstellar way or even interdimensionally, they're like, yeah, like your technology is superior. But it doesn't necessarily mean that everything about their culture or civilization is more technologically advanced. You know, perhaps like how we have uh, fossil fuels on this planet doesn't necessarily mean that other planets have the same sorts of resources. And perhaps there is, is some sort of organic uh, or native resource to wherever they're from that allows for whatever, you know, travel or, or whatever it is. So yeah, no, it's, you can't, you can't look at it. I remember that part of the conversation we were talking. You can't look at things through that, that same lens but it is interesting you know he asked these questions and uh he introduced himself and said that he worked and that his job was a, he was a searcher um and we'll get more into like woody's uh interaction with uh uh Indrid a, a little bit um but anyway <clears throat> the next the next thing that pops up here uh the two boys there's two boys essentially they're walking 
under a uh, underpass through the New Jersey Turnpike on their way to play pinball. So dating this for sure with 1966. I don't know kids that would walk across a highway to go play pinball today. Um, but when they, they saw what they described as the biggest man they'd ever seen standing on the other side of a fence. And essentially it was in a really weird part of like the turnpike. You'd have to walk over a, a crazy busy part of the highway to even get to that spot. And then you would have to walk up a 30 foot embankment, like really steep embankment and down over into this fenced in area. So it didn't make any sense really for somebody to be there. But you know, then again, I live in California and crackheads will do a lot of really weird shit. Um, but <laughs> I'm just saying, but they described him as being seven foot tall and that he was wearing glittering green overalls. They had beady wide set eyes and a very unnatural grin. Um, and here's something I want to introduce into the conversation here that we can t talk about more as these things sort of come up. But even with these these um, incidents like we talked about before, like the black eyed kids or um, some of these instances where people report their encounters with like the men in black. And I have some of those um, instances pulled up that we can talk about, too. And then this um, description of injured cold or whatever this person is. And then the two men that um, Mrs. Yankitas talked to in the parking lot. They look almost human, right? And they're not quite human. And there's something off about them. Um, and I actually have a, a clip pulled up for later to where we can listen to because Woody Derenberger actually gave an interview on his local TV about what happened, which actually coincidentally destroyed his marriage and his, his wife moved away from him with their kids and all kinds of shit. And he still has stuck with the story. So that's, at, you know, to me, lends some credibility to a, a man willing to who, who his family was destroyed by this and didn't like raise the flag. Like, OK, I'm lying, you know, anyway. But that you've heard of the Uncanny Valley, right? Yep. Yeah. So um, for those who don't know, essentially the Uncanny Valley is this this sort of fear that human beings have. And it is an evolutionary development of human beings where we have this um, fear, which is something that we would have had to develop over time. Like we have a fear of the night, um, all these different things. And that, that fear is essentially of things that something that looks human but isn't necessarily human. Um, and that basically there was at one point in our human evolution uh, a need for that sort of fear. And, and I think the most rational description of what the Uncanny Valley is is probably um, you know us as living humans seeing dead bodies and developing a natural uh, fear uh, an irrational fear of those dead bodies because dead bodies attract disease. They attract other predators that eat dead bodies, right? Like hyenas, they'll eat carrion. Um, and so you have that fear and it developed to stay away from dead bodies. But what if, right, just for fun, along the lines, human beings had interactions with other beings that appeared human but weren't. And we developed a fear for those because there was a need to be afraid of them, right? Yes. Yeah, just like, so this, you know, the, there's two things that I always think about, right? There's the uncanny valley, like where does that fear come from? Mm -hmm. And also the, the, the fear of technology. Like as soon mm -hmm. as our tech got to a certain point, humans automatically jumped to the conclusion that one day our technology would cause all these types of things like the, the uncanny valley, you know, problems mm -hmm. and, and right. technology taking over and being dangerous for us and ruining humanity and all these other things. It's like, right. where does that, where does our fear of machinery and the uncanny valley stuff, where does that come from? Right. And, and it's, it's hard for me to jump to the, to, Oh, it's only dead bodies. Like, like, I don't think that's the same thing. Mm. No, I mean, I, I, I can agree with you because like, I mean, I've seen enough dead bodies, you know, dead bodies that died of natural causes and sort of that pallor that a dead body gets and then the lividity they get with like your blood pooling because you're dead and laying, your heart's not pumping anymore, all of these things, right? There's an eerie feeling that comes over you, you know, it kind of goes away over time if you if, if you see these things often enough, for, you know, whatever your line of work is, EMS or police or fire, but it is, it's an odd thing and like... For me, I'll give, give some like anecdotal evidence here. When I had like new airmen and maybe it was the first time they'd seen a dead body, you know, I always try to have like a conversation with them about that because it's a, it's a real experience, you know, you can fuck, suck somebody up. And 
there is always this odd, creepy feeling that comes over people when you see a dead body. So like to me, it does make sense. But at the same time, it's like if you are an arboreal human being, right, like a caveman, and we're developing these fears, right? Like everybody loves fire too, right? And I think that that's like a, a leftover caveman thing too because fire means light, fire means safety, fire eventually means cooking food. So there's all these positive attributes to fire that we just all seem to love, right? And sort of how like dogs have developed a parts of their brain that they know that human beings and, you know, and them have this natural uh, relationship, right? But that if you're a human, let's say that we're in a tribe together and somebody dies, you know, tribes develop and humans over time have developed these rituals we have to deal with dead bodies. Even there was um, there was a, a, a documentary I saw on um, Netflix not that long ago about a cave where they discovered all of these other um, human or not. They're not human, but these other um, humanoid like, you know, long, like a, oh, damn it, I'm trying to remember the, the word here, um, kind of struggling, but like other evolutionary gaps in hum, humans, right? Like um, upright beings that uh, were a part of like our evolutionary trail were burying their dead, right? So right. Um, you know, like Australopithecus is, is along that trail, but there is, um, I'm trying to remember the name of these uh these beings but whatever anyway they were burying their dead and that's very rare and it's the first time that they found um an uh anthropomorphoid you know being that was burying their dead that wasn't humans and i'm probably saying that really wrong don't fuck me up in the comments um but whatever their name is and i could look it up real fast just for the sake of it but anyway um you know we develop these rituals of dealing with our dead and there's not a fear there. It's just like you, of course, are going to recognize that it's a natural part of life and death. You know, it's a cycle. And there's not really a fear of it. Like there's fear of death, but not fear of the body, so to speak. Like obviously if you happen upon a dead body and you have no idea what happened, let's just say you're walking through the woods and you come upon a dead body. Like there's probably going to be a, in the initial shock and then maybe some fear over like what happened here? Do I need to leave the area? That sort of thing. You know, so to your point about the uncanny valley, I guess that sort of does – kind of takes away from the idea that maybe it is because of dead bodies and that's where the, that developed. Yeah, I don't know. I, no? I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm not sure if it's the, the dead bodies thing. Like, unless, so like we, we also have a fear of zombies. I don't know where all that stuff came from or whatever. Uh, and, and the humans are also weird though. So like I could say whatever I want, but also we have dreams which are wild uh, they're, they're very, you know, uh, you know, psychedelic in a lot of ways. And right. so like, I'm not sure if we all just have similar dreams that, that leads to some of these, these fears as well. Like if someone dies, do we all dream about the dead person and that's what leads mm -hmm. to these things. Um, but I don't, you know, like I, I think there's something more to it and, you know, and, and I always, I always make that connection to the tech stuff too. Like, I just don't know where our fear of technology comes from. It seems at this point pretty well founded. Um, mm -hmm. but very early on in our, you know, industrial age techn technological development, mm -hmm. smart people were like, Hey, um, this could be a bad idea. And, and, and based on the, the literature that was sold and all the, the popularity of a lot of the science fiction stuff, everybody else shared and agreed with a lot of the same uh, sentiments. Do you think that maybe this like fear of technology though, is sort of just human beings and our fear of the unknown, um, because if you go back and look at like when the car was introduced, there were smear campaigns against automobiles, you know, by horse, you know, hor husbandry, hor horsing, you know, people, horse right? People. And yeah. yeah, horse people, you know, ranchers and and what the like, you know, people that use horses for all kinds of things, and smear campaigns about TV. I mean, hell, there were even like smear campaigns about the internet. And I remember some like article from like late the later part of the '90s where they were saying the internet was dead and that people don't use it. And, um, yeah, oh I'd, I'd have to find it. Yeah. It's, it's like Swing obviously just absolutely wrong. Yeah. Like <laughs> no shit, you know, cause here we are. Um, but no, so I found, um, what I was talking about. So it's, uh, the rising star cave in South Africa. Uh, so this is significant discoveries made the remains of an early human ancestor, Homo Naledi. 
Um, and that in 2013, paleoanthropologists uncovered thousands of fossils belonging to at least 15 individuals deep within the cave system. And this is like really hard. Have you seen this documentary? It's actually pretty amazing. They had mm -hmm. to like drag the dead through this cave up and over like down a shaft and into an opening in this cave system where they buried them. So it wasn't like dragging people into a cave or like carrying them into a cave that was easy. Like it was a it was an arduous and dangerous task to get them to this room inside the cave system where they were burying the dead. Um, but anyway, they are an early hominid. That's the word I was looking for was hominid um, related to humans, but not humans. But it is basically obvious that they were deliberately burying their dead and there's no other human ancestor that we know of that buried the dead and it's essentially thought to be specific to homo sapiens and um so that was why it was like super interesting so they're just making the point to what you were saying that as beings hominids or humans you know homo sapiens modern humans we have rituals for the dead because we care about those people we knew them in life so I agree with you that there's more of a care and probably a sadness and that connectedness you had with that person more than the fear of it, obviously, you know. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I agree with you, which just further begs the question, what the fuck was everybody afraid of so much that this fear developed over time for something that appears human but isn't human? Um, and then why that's so creepy with like this grinning man that these kids saw, right? I mean, you, you ever see someone that's not like a, a, a smiler try to smile, you know, like they've got like that dead eyes, expressionless smile. Yeah. Like that. The, like when your the, toddler the tries thing. to smile. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. talking about? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's, you know, like if, if you were going to train someone or program something to be there, like, Hey, it looks like they make this, this thing with their mouth mm -hmm. and it puts yeah. other people at ease. And so this like right. thing shows up and is like. Hello, what is right. happening here? It's that's weird. Exactly. And then, yeah. No, it's actually like one of the the other notes like I made is like, what if the reason why um, all of these beings like the Men in Black, um, the Black Eyed Kids, Injured Cold, is they just don't know how to, how to behave human and like whatever it is they're pulling from. And your explanation I thought was really interesting about how like maybe they're just seeing Earth at a different time because of their vantage point in space, basically, right? That that's how they address people. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps it is that like trickster notion, like I was saying how they can't be completely too good at tricking you because and then it wouldn't be fair. But um, whatever it is, obviously super, super odd and very strange that we have developed that fear over time. Well, I think it's it's weird that we never talk about aliens being afraid of us. And I know mm -hmm. I talked about it a little bit last time. But if, if you know, no one ever talks about, like, maybe they are super concerned about us. You know what I mean? We, we, ha we yeah. always have this thing where, like, the aliens are here to jack us up and do all these things and, 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 and you know, stop us from killing ourselves. Or a, a, a thousand different reasons why they're here, right? Everything from the, you know, very sinister to them trying to keep us from... Uh, blowing the world to pieces with nuclear weaponry. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe they really are just these, these searchers that are not that technologically advanced, not the way that we are, right? Or it's mm -hmm. a totally different tracks. Mm -hmm. But they show up, and by the time they get here, we are. We're killing people by the hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands with these nuclear bombs. We're mm -hmm. very violent uh, you know, creatures, and they're like, I don't know what this is, and we need to study them. But their study methods apparently are garbage, compared you know right. what i mean like yeah from our perspective and so they're, they're sending these people there and they're trying to figure it out and they just they're not that good at it you know yeah. uh if they can communicate with their brains which doesn't mean any technology that just means some other evolutionary advancement that happened for them mm -hmm. uh the the way that we communicate everything about us is going to seem so strange and to crack that nut in a period of what a hundred years or mm -hmm. even longer is going to be very, very difficult, especially if you're like, if we are considering distances that they're traveling and communications, the way they communicate and how they, they understand their own scientific process, you know, to try to get to, to a point where they can communicate and understand us so that we yeah. don't steal their technology and, you know, rampage to the universe and nuke all of them. Um, 
it's a, it's a big problem. Eagles screeching in, right? No. <laughs> right. Well, no, I mean, I, I like that, that you, you put it in that, in that context because, like, alien contact, if you want to call it alien, because there is so much information that's come out over the last couple of years with the whole UAP disclosure thing. And then earlier this week, there was the whistleblower. Apparently, it was a flag-level officer who was the whistleblower um, who blew the lid off of this immaculate constellation special access program that the government has as a uh, like a crash retrieval program and when the government basically went the congress went to like ask like the department of justice i think about it they were like hey what do you know about this and they're like oh we don't know anything about immaculate constellation and they're like well we didn't even tell you the name so you kind of just fucking speaking of people that suck at what they do yeah yeah no shit right um but the point of that is that the government is saying that – or this whistleblower is saying that the government knows they're here first off, but that they're not aliens in the sense that we think of or have maybe like raised to think of um, as these off-planet beings that come from another another planet, another galaxy, another part of the universe, right? But that they're actually here and have been here for a very long time. Um, And then there's this whole other aspect of the UAP thing that has a religious aspect to it. And I think we probably talked about her the last time we talked, um, an author, uh, and she is a a professor of religious studies at UNC Wilmington. Her name is Diana Walsh Pasolka. Does this sound familiar? We talked about her maybe? Uh, Pasolka sounds familiar. Yeah, I'll just recap real fast. So she wrote a couple of, she's written a couple books, three of them I know uh, for sure. But the first one is called Heaven Can Wait. And then the other two, one is called American Cosmic. And then her latest is called Encounters. And in the first one, she essentially outlines all of these experiences that um, saints have had in their lifetime, people who are venerated as saints, and that these some of these experiences are 100% supernatural in nature, and that they describe interactions with beings that they called angels. Uh, they spoke with them telepathically, that these people that had these interactions um, routinely were able to perform supernatural acts, whether it was like they were glowing or they were able to levitate or they knew things that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to know. And they just knew it when somebody came into their presence. Um, and that essentially all of these descriptions that these religious you know, saints, these religious people went through are the same sorts of experiences that people who encounter UAP and modernity describe having. And she sort of like drew this pretty easy connection here saying that, well, these look like the exact same experiences that people have. And there probably are the same experiences, right? And that it's just, it never stopped, right? It never stopped happening. And that there's, there are these connections to why these people have these experiences, right? You know, these are people that have um, processes, she calls them protocols that they go through every day, sort of like, you know, in the military, like a special operator would have these protocols to go to before getting ready for a mission, right? Um, But that they are very intent on how they study, how they pray, you know, the things they do every single day, and that that's, there's a key aspect of it, too. Um, But anyway, you know, basically that these are not alien from another planet beings, but that they are either spiritual or interdimensional beings. And that's sort of the, the, supposition that john keel walked away from and in a lot of his books he calls them ultra terrestrials um and injured cold is an ultra terrestrial he wrote a lot about men in black too and called them ultra terrestrials um his sort of conclusion is that they are interdimensional beings but there's that aspect too there's you know i think we have to totally shift how we view this and it's not the x files coming from another planet you know, thing that we kind of all grew up with and, and what like sci- science fiction throughout like the middle part of the 20th century would, would have you think it, you know, potentially these are spiritual interdimensional beings that just exist here on this planet or in this dimension and can come and go as they, as they please, basically. Maybe they can't come and go as they please though. You know, maybe it takes an insane amount of effort to come and go as you please. That's interesting. And what, That's what kind point. of, what kind of matter and what kind of information flows easily between dimensions right you know what i mean like 
Like, so, like, if we're talking about aliens, we're talking about space, time, distance, all those other things that we, we kind of understand. Mm-hmm. We talk about interdimensional, like, it's the, the, the and I, I'm always trying to, like, figure out that the, uh, the, you know, the assumptions that we're making, we're uh, making the assumptions that traveling interdimensionally is, is easy for them, uh, that matter uh, travels interdimensionally in, in certain ways, that knowledge travels interdimensionally in certain ways, that you're able to retain everything from one dimension to the next mm-hmm. um, and, and back and forth. And so, you know, like what we, we, we don't know anything about the other dimension. You know what I mean? Like, Right. So we would assume like, hey, you can just bebop in and out whenever you want. And like you should, you know, again, the, 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 the assumptions about advancement and the assumptions about, you know, how they collect knowledge and their culture and all these other things and how they view us, what we actually look like to them. If you come from another dimension and, you know, maybe the color white doesn't exist in that dimension for, you know, in a very physical way or what like the reason for the black eyes or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, so like. I don't know. Maybe it's it's just one of those things. If if it's a, an arduous journey, if if certain things get wiped, like they keep coming back asking the same questions, maybe it's just really hard for them to remember once they get to the other side. You know, you know, in the religious text, you talk about the veil, right? The veil where mm-hmm. you came from the other side and you don't remember anything. If we are a race, a species of people that came from the other side, and we came from that veil, just like the the veil that when we were born, right, and we po- become part of this collective on this side of the interdimensional whatever uh uh, the the, into our dimension Mm -hmm. then you lose memory you lose all these things like matter information all these other things do not travel uh, through the dimensions the way that we would think that it would right does that make any Uh, sense at all to anybody no it makes total sense and it kind of ties into some of the stuff we were talking about before and it made me think a little bit about like reincarnation um the idea of reincarnation because there are stories of people who say they were reincarnated and they have these memories from their previous life. Like there's a pretty famous one that was on Unsolved Mysteries about a guy who died in the first American submarine to go down during World War II, the USS Shark. And he has memories of being and dying in that, um, that submarine. And he was actually reincarnated while his family was still on, like still alive, and then was able to link up with those people and then remembered all this stuff that he would have had no idea or no way of knowing as the person he reincarnated as. Pretty crazy. So like maybe there is some sort of ability for that stuff to travel through, but maybe not for everybody, right? And maybe sort of those – like let's say if you have like a really heavy draw to – Rome, right? And like, it's almost like you don't understand why you have this super heavy draw to it. Maybe you were Roman in a past life, or maybe you were Greek or whatever it was, right? These things, you're drawn to them, right? And then it also makes me think about what I was saying about these people receiving information, sort of what, like, to to mention Dr. Pasolka again, downloading information. Um, This information has the ability to travel across dimensions, but you have to do specific things in order to get them. Um, And like those, these protocols she mentions like, uh, like Jack Parsons. I know we talked about him the last time and I've talked about him Mm -hmm. in the podcast a few times, like the father of American, you know, rocket science essentially here was, was bros with Aleister Crowley and L Ron Hubbard, you know, the dude who (laughs) founded Scientology. Right. But they did this, uh, crazy occult sex magic and he says literally that that's where he got all this information to to you know do the physics and write out these equations for this shit was was from his interactions with beings in another dimension yeah well i mean that that, i mean you talk about artists with the muse you talk about right where where does it all come from where does inspiration come from where does all this stuff stuff come from like Mm -hmm. is is there just like most of humanity that has ever existed and will exist on the other side of this dimension that we can tap into in a very limited way uh at at certain times in our life and then through certain rituals and through certain other things um but it's just not direct flow you know because of whatever you know interdimensional changes that happen you know and and It's a weird thing, you know, you talk about people that do like ayahuasca, DMT, all that other stuff. They talk about this stuff all the time, like it's a very real thing. And and so I think there's just so much that we we have zero knowledge about what would be on the other side of that dimension and what it's like traveling between the dimensions, right? So I I think Mm -hmm. any of the assumptions that we make, um, we are basing those on our perceived reality from where we are at. And therefore, we are probably 99% wrong about how this works. Yeah, you sort of not even able to 
conceptualize those things because of our development, basically, and how we how we were viewing things. Right, and and is that, that is that by design? You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. what, is, you know, like you, yeah, you, you talk about all these other things too, and I'm like, where do, where do these fears come from? It, what, what if the other dimension? Uh, is is a, just an older race of humans that that already went down the path of technology and AI and everything was just you know ruined and then you know at some point they managed to make a new dimension of reality and therefore get to start over and then they're you know we, when we talk about those aliens right like they're trying to figure out where they went wrong harvest you know biological material and all these other things and create you know something that they can take back to their side. Uh, to save their own race or to to get them back on track or anything else like that. Well, it's funny you say that because a lot of the um, more recent, like a lot of the recent encounters people have with with these beings, whatever you want to call them, some of them describe themselves as time travelers, that they say that they are humans from the future coming back here, essentially trying to figure out how to like fix things, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. and that if it's even possible to fix things, because if you consider like the whole like multiple timeline multiverse idea and right. And guys, like I'm not an expert, you know, on any of this stuff. So like, if I say some shit that's wrong, like, let me know, you know, this isn't meant by any means to be like the definitive podcast on any of this shit. But that even if you could go back in time, like the whole idea of going back in time and killing Hitler, like even if you killed baby Hitler or you killed Hitler after World War One, all you're doing is creating another timeline. This timeline already exists. You're not altering what we've already experienced here, all the atrocities of Nazi Germany. You're just setting up another timeline wherein there is no Hitler, but it doesn't actually change the timeline you're in anyway, you know? So maybe they're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, but there's all this, there is, there's all this stuff like that. Maybe they are just time travelers. Yeah. Well, and, and you're assuming that it would change the timeline anyway, that much, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, those, those are the assumptions too. Right. And then the, 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 the way that the human brain works, we, we like simple answers. Like Adolf Hitler right. created this entire problem. It's like, or, or the, the, the German people and most of Europe was incredibly anti-Semitic. These, these ideas were incredibly popular sure. and you uh, subjugated a population because of a war that wasn't necessarily 100% their fault. And that we, we threw all the blame on them and we tried to crush a very proud people. And whether it was that dude or another dude, you were probably going right. to end up with the same results. If it wasn't him, it would have been somebody else, basically. And then you, you, right. know, you have to consider just sort of like all of what Germany had to go through after World War I, starting it, basically, and then having to pay the reparations and pay for all the damages they caused and you know just what that did to the German economy and the Weimar Republic eventually collapsing and leading to all that stuff. Not to get too historical and boring, but let's talk about some of the other things that that happened right sort of that same which is crazy it's like the same month and some of this shit happened like the same week um so mrs uh where's her name again i want to say it wrong mrs yankitas goes and reports this stuff to the police and her story makes like the local news and because those two boys they had that experience with the, the person on the other side of the fence who when they were walking across the street let me just wrap that up was looking at a house. They said that he was looking in the direction of a house and that as he as they approached, he turned and looked at them and that's when they were able to see that he had this creepy, broad, unnatural grin. And that's where Keel got the idea of the grinning man, right? Um, but his description, their description of them, the glittering green overalls matches what um, Derenberger said that Injured Cold looked like, though Injured Cold to Derenberger did not have that like creepy, unnatural, expressionless grin like they, they described, right? Uh, maybe, maybe, dude, maybe Injured Cold just knows that you can scare kids really easy and was just fucking with these kids. You never know, man. Don't want to assume anything, right? If you've um, ever seen Americans try to interact with people from another country, though, some people are good at it and some people aren't, you dude, know, I, I actually I wrote this down. I, I thought that um, I actually made this connection. So I fucking love that you said this. This is perhaps these people just know enough to mimic us, but aren't good at it. Sort of like when you go to a foreign country <laughs> and you start mimicking the language or the co- the culture, you're close, but not close enough. Right. Yeah. And it's just what happens when you're in an unfamiliar environment, right? So, I mean, maybe they fuck up and make faux pas too, just like us. You never know, dude. It could be something as simple as that. Not necessarily, it doesn't have to be something nefarious, right? 
Dude, that grinning man is trying so hard. He wants that promotion. Right. He wants to be the best searcher on earth, you know? And is the it, other guy is, is just like you're natural. He's like, hey, man, right. let's have a what, – what's going on here? What's up, you know? dude? What's going yeah. on, man? It, yeah, that guy was like, I heard you kids say pinball. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, fuck. No. But anyway, so yeah. after after uh, they, they found out uh, about her reporting that, they went and reported to um, authorities what they – had their interaction they had um and keel actually did an interview with those kids he did like separate one-on-one interviews and then a joint interview with them and, and basically came to the conclusion that they were being honest about what they said right anyway um but what he did do as well is go um and have a conversation with Woodrow Derenberger, and he had a conversation with another family um in Parkersburg the the Lily family right so let me kind of eat this elephant one bite at a time here. Um, Indrid saw, um, or excuse me, Derenberger saw Indrid on November 2nd, 1966. So he was driving along the highway headed towards Parkersburg, um, which is coincidentally an hour away from Point Pleasant where Mothman was seen and eventually the the bridge collapsed there, right? Um, And that basically a craft, what he described as like a kerosene lantern shape, would eventually fly over and land land on the highway. And his, his, his car stopped and a being came out of this craft. And sort of the funny thing about the craft is that it's almost like steampunky when you read about the description of it. And like the door, it creaks, right? And like it, it, it opens automatically, but it's not like this like seamless like, you know, like on Close Encounters of the Third Kind or some shit. It's like, you know, maybe Indrid is like a redneck where he's from. And this is his old like 1966 Buick. You have your hand up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Or Mr. they're stealing our technology to mix with their Ooh. technology. Maybe, dude. Maybe it was an old squeaky Buick door hinge, dude. Well, because if, if you go back, like, especially, like, religious stuff, and these mm-hmm. people can float by themselves. Right. Or whatever. Right. But, like, they hadn't made crafts yet. And until we start, That's like, industrializing everything, and then they start coming over here and learning how to, like, manipulate metal from us and to create things, then they can integrate with their, you know, gravitational, uh, you know, uh, you know, changing technology that they have that's just for them and these people are just not that smart because Dude. they can be lazy because where they come from it's easy um they start to mimic our stuff and, and mix it with their own technology so when they come back and the first iterations of their craft are just like the first couple cars that we made or whatever that we made trains they were kind of they're kind of dog shit that's actually a really interesting thought because like the government literally has a crash retrieval program and you wouldn't need a crash retrieval program if this didn't happen often enough, right? right? So there's there's a need for this apparently, right? Dude, what if like they're just not good at metallurgy like humans have become because of the resources we have on this planet, right? And that they try to incorporate iron, steel, or whatever they find here into whatever the hell they're using and it just doesn't jive. I mean, dude, like that makes as, – as dorky as that sounds, like – it could be something that simple, man. I mean, I, li- I like the way you think, Trent. That's good I'm stuff. Just, I'm just asking. Just a- I mean, fair questions. Uh, so yeah, no. Indrid gets out, gets out, comes up. He's. I'm gonna read you uh, his uh, description of him. Uh, actually, uh, actually, this would be. I'm gonna. I'm gonna share the video here so you can listen to what he says awesome. directly from the horse's mouth. All right. Can you see it? Yep. All right. Uh, what type well, of uh, did he wear? He had a top coat on, and it was zippered down the front. Uh, his top, uh, the top two buttons, like my coat here, were open, and he this uh, outfit was a, a shiny material. It was a, a glossy outfit, uh, like it was metallic, I suppose you would call it. And his shirt was a little bit darker than his jacket. And below his coat, he had on trousers of uh, the same kind of a cloth material. And I believe the trousers were just a shade lighter than his coat. Which would have been a uh, navy blue. The coat would have been a dark blue. Yes. Uh, What about the 
what about the texture of his skin, the color of his skin, uh, his eyes, eyebrows, eyelashes, hairline? Uh, what, what were these? Uh, what did he look like? He looked perfectly natural and normal as any human being. He had uh, his face looked like he had a, a good tan, a deep sun tan. He was not too dark, but it was just like he had been out in the sun a lot and had a good tan. His hair was combed straight back, and it was a dark brown. And he, he seemed to have uh, a good thick head of hair. And his eyebrows, his face, uh, his features were not very normal. Uh, I don't believe that he looked any different from any other man that we'd meet on the street. Now, this Okay, so I'll stop it there. I mean, that's describes him as a as a normal tan guy, which is interesting because the description of these kids there in New Jersey describing what Keel says sounds like injured cold, right? Doesn't necessarily match the description that Woodrow Derenberger himself gave of cold. And Derenberger was actually given the name cold. And then eventually at another encounter, the full name of injured cold to him. Um, and those kids were never given a name, right? But he Keel saw this interview, the one we just showed on, on the, the television program, where he said that his name was was cold. And that's where that name came from. And Keel was like, well, this sounds very similar to what happened here in New Jersey that I'm investigating. And he goes and he ends up meeting another family as well who has an experience with a being and some other crazy stuff that happens that is more in line with what those kids in New Jersey saw. Hmm. Um, but anyway, Derenberger says that injured spoke to him telepathically. Like I said before, um, that he said that you can either talk out loud or you can use your thoughts, but that I'm going to speak to you telepathically. Um, repeatedly cold basically said, you know, I'm not here to hurt you. You don't need to be afraid. Why are you afraid? He asked him, uh, you know, well, you know, when you learn too later, we'll talk about because Indrid supposedly takes um, Woody to Lanulos, where he is from. This is the planet that Indrid says he is from. And they don't have the concept of hate. Everybody there gets along. It's this like essentially like perfect society. And that's um, Woodrow Derenberger actually wrote a book and his daughter wrote a book as well about, um, you know, his interactions with Indrid Cold and going to Lanulos. Um, so it, I guess it kind of makes sense that. He doesn't understand why Woodrow is afraid of him because they don't have those to what we were talking about before. They don't experience those things where they're at. So it seems weird that he would ask him or say to him, like, why are you afraid? Don't be afraid of me. But perhaps that notion of fear and then, you know, whatever, somebody's going to hurt you. They don't have to worry about where they're at. You know, because Earth is the hood either of the universe or the multiverse. That's right. why. All right, bro. Right. Dude, it wouldn't surprise me at all if that's continue or that is 100% what what we are is the ghetto of the universe. You know, Just you, downtown St. Louis. You know, I was told as a young child uh, mm -hmm. growing up in Utah in that culture, and they're they're very much into some stuff like that. That, that we were told that Earth was like the most difficult planet to grow up on. I wouldn't doubt it, man. I mean, look at what we're dealing with right now. You never know. Yeah, things are I mean, wild. They are. So uh, anyway, so Derenberger was continuously communicated to from Indrid. Like I said, um, it eventually ruined his marriage. And what's up? I keep interrupting. I'm sorry. I was oh, no, you're fine. Oh, no. Why are you apologizing? Dude, get the fuck out of here with you. <laughs> Stuff your sorry's in a sack, man. Um, but no, it ruined his, ruined his marriage. Um, after he went on TV, people started showing up at his home. People would park across the street. People would hide in the woods, all this stuff, basically hoping to catch, you know, like a sight of Indrid or a UFO, something by watching Derenberger's family. Uh, and it eventually led to his kids being bullied at school. Um, and, it's, and it's when basically his wife decided that she'd had enough and moved uh, with the kids um, to another part of uh, the country and away from him. And they eventually uh, got divorced. But one night when Indrid was coming home from work, he was getting out of his truck and telepathically he heard in his mind again, 
um, Woodrow, don't be afraid. It's me, Indrid. And he turned around and Indrid was there again. But he brought somebody else with him whose name was Carl, which I just think is super interesting, <laughs> bro. Like of all of the names in the universe, I assume are out there. Carl is who he brings with him. Maybe maybe Indrid came back and was like, bro, found out that the game, the name that we chose for me, not cool. It's not good. No one's named no. Indrid. Whoever came back and told us to, to use the name Indrid as my cover, you know, right. name to, for right. these humans, uh, found out not cool. But there's a lot of Carls. Carl's pretty cool, man. Carl's pretty common, right? No, that's actually, again, this this is, doesn't not make sense, you know? It doesn't not make sense. Um, but dude, so here's some of the interesting stuff that, uh, Derenberger or, um, Cold tells Woodrow. Um, he says on Lanulos, which exists in the Ganymede, uh, universe or galaxy that Lanulans don't use money. They had a communal society where all needs were met and everyone works together for the common good. Maybe, maybe that's who this Carl was, right? It was, it was Marx. Um, Lanulans wore minimal clothing, which was often skin tight and futuristic in appearance. They only clothed themselves for practical reasons, due, not due to modesty, as nudity was considered natural and not taboo in their culture. Um, technology of Lanulose was far beyond what human beings had in the 1960s. Um, and Derenberger in his book mentioned their ability to travel between galaxies using spacecraft as well as their advanced medical technology that allowed them to live long, healthy lives. At one point, Indrid tells Woodrow that they live anywhere between 120 to 175 Earth years, which is pretty wild. He also says, too, um, he mentions, which I find to be interesting, that the longer they spend on Earth, that that time can sort of affect how long or what the longevity of their own life is. So it's sort of that like space time relativity thing, right? Or, or it's, it's funny, it, it, you know, when you meet someone and they're just arrogant about something because they're just mm -hmm. ignorant, it's like, well, we live forever because our, our medical stuff is so much better. And it's like, or the radiation that you're bombarded with on your planet. And because of your environmental conditions, you just live longer anyway. But you're That's like, true. no, but our, our doctors are so much better than yours. Why do you guys not live longer? It's like, bro, if you maybe if you lived here, you would also die at 78 years old, like I'm going right. to. That's actually a pretty fair statement because, I mean, we do that to one another on this planet all the time. Yeah. It's, you know. I mean, no. yeah. Do you, do you think the doctors in Japan are better than the doctors in the United States, at least, I don't know. you they know, historically be. speaking? Or is their diet just way better than, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's, 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 yeah. I, I think that these beings are probably just as, as, uh, uh, able to draw incorrect conclusions as we are. Right. No, absolutely. I mean, this, again, there's these parallels between human beings, what we know and the mistakes that we make and these other beings, whatever it is. And that honestly, it makes more sense than finding connections and, or patterns, right. And things that, don't actually exist right right and making it all like super creepy um, but one of the other things that um uh john keel one of the other things that john keel investigated was with the lily family that i was telling you about right so i'm just kind of read this to you uh this happened the same um the same time frame that what happened to uh, Woodrow, and then also when the Mothman was sighted by all those people in Point Pleasant, and then the Silver Bridge collapse, right? Um, so Lily and his wife, essentially, they started having experiences in their home that sound a lot like poltergeist activity. Um, if you're familiar, yeah, when you're familiar with poltergeist activity, so it's kind of read you some of the things that they um, they experienced. So sometimes they would hear uh, unusual mechanical sounding buzzing noises, um, phantom scratching noises phantom baby crying noises um yeah which is pretty creepy uh not gonna lie that would freak me out along with uh phantom voices that sounded like talking but you could not really you know tell what was what was being said um and then you know sudden cold spots <laughs> unnerving feeling of being watched you cracked me up dude i have no idea what you're laughing about but i fucking love it <laughs> It's like, oh, no, I, I hear people talking all the time, and I, it's just the voices in my head, you know? You're describing my, like, what happens at night, and I, I chalk a lot of it up to hearing loss and a bunch of other things, uh, but I hear babies cry out, you know, 
you were you were trying to like go to sleep and in between sleep and wake you hear your kids screaming or like mm-hmm. you hear people talking yes or like you know that, that adrenaline spike that happens that keeps you from sleeping the rest of the night right but like these are all the things that you hear or like something scratching or so you know like and and, oh, and, yeah. and when you wake up and when you finally figure it out that it was like that's not a real sound that I just heard or I, my kids are not screaming. I, you know, check the house, check everything. Everything's fine. But mm-hmm. anyway, sorry. I was just laughing because I was like, well, welcome to welcome to life. <laughs> you know, right. sorry. Yeah, no. I'm sure it was creepy for these people. It's probably way more, you know, whatever. But I was yeah. just laughing. No, so. dude, it's funny. I'll give you a funny story. My wife hung like a coat um, like rack up on the wall with all these hooks. And then she hung up a bunch of her hoodies on the wall. And then the night we went to bed that she did this, like there's enough light coming in through the windows in my bedroom. And there's just, I I roll over in bed after waking up and all I see is this just like almost human-like figure, figure against the wall that was blacker than the rest of the room. And like, obvious I'm into paranormal shit. So like the first fucking thought I had was like shadow people scared the fuck out of me until I realized it was just a bunch of hoodies on the same fucking hook, dude. I dude, And now I know what it is because the hoodies are still there. But like it threw me off, bro, for like a good like hour after that because of that. It, like my heart went up, you know, and like that, like initial like, oh, I got to fucking do something. And then I realized probably within the same moment that my brain was panicking that that's just the hoodie she hung on the wall couldn't go to sleep for a while so did, did that ever happen me. in basic sorry side note like you know like how in, people... in basic training everybody hang their hangs their uniforms like on the outside of their locker at night or whatever yeah yeah yeah, yeah. they like yeah i know what you're talking about you never woke up and thought that everybody was already standing at attention and dressed and you were like no. the last one that out never of bed. happened to me no. that happened to well, you yeah you know because like Dude. i'm just like wake up and see and like, there's like, it looks like a whole bunch of people. And then, you know, in your brain, you're like, oh crap, did I miss, am I the last one awake? Or, or are these, all these people standing here? It was, it was weird. Cause it's like sounds, all like these. I was just like saying, it sounds a lot like waking up and thinking you missed the bus to school, but you didn't, you know, but except yours comes with shadows and, and that really doesn't, you know, probably a similar panic. We had a lot of sleepwalkers on my basic flight. It was, it was a problem. I don't know. Really? I know a lot of. Yeah, oh yeah, dude. There was, so there was this guy. Um, so I was the um, like EC monitor at basic training. So I had to make the schedule for everybody to do fire watch, and so that no one could bitch to me about their schedule, I did it every night for eight weeks. Okay, and um, so somebody was like, "Oh, I don't want to be like the motherfucker." I've I've done it every day. Okay, so you can shut the fuck up and get out of my face. But I'm doing it one night, and I'm standing there. At the stupid little counter that they have there, and I'm talking to whoever the fuck it was I was posted with, and and this dude I went to Meps with, okay, and we had the same recruiter comes walking around the corner, he's in PT gear, and in the time period that I went to basic training, everybody got issued the same black messenger bag to carry that stupid basic training guide in, okay. Mm-hmm. Which is like, because I know they don't do that anymore and it's changed it, but it was a black messenger bag. But he comes walking around the corner with his black messenger bag, like around his body, and he had his cover, like folded in that, like, banana shape, you know? And he had it tucked up, up underneath the messenger bag strap across his chest. And he comes walking around the corner, and it's like midnight, okay? And I'm like, yo, was like, what the fuck are you doing? And he just looks at me, and it it took, takes me a second to realize that, like, his eyes are fucking closed, okay? Because I'm just so kind of thrown by the fact that he walked around the corner, like, ready to leave the, the, the you know, the bay. Okay, like, go out the door. And um, he says, I can't find my flashlight. Uh, and Homeboy had his Lackland laser in his hand, dude. Like, was holding it, okay? Yeah. And I even, me and the other guy, like, pointed at him, like, it's in your hand. And then I realized his fucking eyes were closed and it like, I was like, oh shit, he's sleepwalking. And even, and I said that to the other guy and I, I said his name to him a few times. I'm like, go back to bed. I'm like, you're fine. Go back to bed. And he eventually said, like, I'll go back to bed and like went back to bed. We had a dude that would wake up and, and go into the day room in the middle of the night and set the alarm off all the time, which was terrific. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. Cause dude, it took a while for like the, the TIs in uh, CQ to like, 
believe the story that this motherfucker was sleepwalking. You know what I mean? Because like he's not trying to escape, guys. He's just not wandering try- around. Right. He's not. You know, we're not. Dig- we're not going to read the Book of Mormon. The only thing in this room to do, you know, or the Bible, right? Because there's nothing in there except a TV and you know a table and then religious books, right? No, there's nothing so cool going on. Like no one's going in there. But this cat, the the dude that I just told you about. I caught him sleepwalking all the time by virtue of me having Firewatch every night. And a lot of people saw him do this. Like one night I I woke up uh, or I was walking up and down the halls and he had woken up and was sleepwalking. But he had his pillow in his lap like sitting on the end of his bed. And he was just kind of like mushing the pillow together. And I walked over to him and I asked him what he was doing because as I walked down the the middle of the beds, I couldn't tell if he was like actually awake or sleepwalking. So I just kind of treated it like he was awake for a second. But he told me that he was making his e-fold, right? And like the blanket, you know, they called it an e-fold. And he was making yeah. – and he was mushing his pillow together. And I just was like, this motherfucker is sleepwalking again and just like walked away from him. Yeah, and just uh, go back to bed. Do I know. It. One night he woke up out of bed and he took like a sprint down the middle of the beds and then sprinted all the way back. That actually woke me up. That was the only time like somebody like weirdly woke me up and then like the somebody waking me up for whatever fucking other dumb shit was going on. But yeah, he had, did sleepwalking problems on my basic training flight. Super weird. Dude, we had, we had the same job in basic training. And I was, I was so sleep depth by the time I got out of there because mm-hmm. the same stuff I was on night watch every single night. And yeah. if somebody messed up, our TI would make me finish out the rest of the night. Oh, yeah. Yep. And so it was just like every single night someone would mess yep. up. And then you're you're up every single night, and so by the time you get out of there, I remember that uh, like 13 hour bus ride to to Keysler Air Force Base from Lackland. Mm-hmm. I slept the whole way. I was so, so <laughs> you, tired. Yeah, I was saying you were probably like fuck yeah, and like just it was amazing, ow, dog. Yeah, right. Dude, yeah, I know. I got every time that we had somebody gonna come up right to with some special person. They always just she always just swept out switched out whoever the fuck was pulling it in the first place and then put me there, you know. So I was yep. kind of like got my ass chewed for other people's bullshit all the time at, at BMT. Good times. I mean, I kept that was like that's a theme through my career, constantly getting my ass chewed for other people's <laughs> bullshit, you know. But yeah. anyway, security Sorry. forces, <clears throat> NCO life, it's all good. No, no, no. This is this is this is why you're here, man. We can talk we're about going back to we're not, the, we're not the interdimensional ourselves. beings. We are the Mothman. Yeah, yeah. The Mothman, yeah. And um, anyway, so um, this is going to introduce some of like this Men in Black shit, okay? Um, they also, the Lily family, also had run-ins with the Men in Black. And they would come to the house. They threatened them with like not talking about stuff that was going on. They would see UFOs flying over their house. And um, Kiel basically investigated with them a couple times through the period of 1966 to 1967, basically just like documenting their experiences and then the experiences they had with like the threats and stuff from like these men in black. Um, But in the middle of like this investigation, after some time had gone on, the daughter, Mr. Lilly's daughter, came forward and finally admitted that one night – through some questioning, he found this answer. I should back up for a second. He was asking, have you guys had any dreams of somebody being in your home, um, you know, and basically trying to maybe maybe you're experiencing something, right? And they said no. But the daughter said that she woke up one night to a large man standing over her with a crazy, you know, insane grin on his face and that it scared the shit out of her. Um, and so there is there's the other connect there with the what happened in New Jersey. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the same person, right? It could just be there's multiple. I mean, it could just be this is maybe there's a race of these people, or it's an inter- you know whatever whatever reason this person is or this thing is scaring people across the country. But that happened to her, right? Yeah. I'm not gonna lie to you, bro. I'd be fucking scared out of my damn mind if I woke up in some fucking thing was standing over me smiling like a jackass like that dude yeah i mean yeah that's why does it happen to the older people too it didn't it just happened to the daughter which is interesting how old was she 16 i think there's a time at least for me there was a time in my life when like weird stuff stopped happening you know what do you mean you remember being younger and like just certain things happened or you would feel certain things or or you see certain things 
I don't so know, I don't know if we life, ever had this conversation. Kinda... Have you? Did you grow up having like supernatural experiences? Not like a t- not like a lot, right? But I'm pretty not sure. Not a lot. I saw... But what did you have? So like the, the 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 creepiest one is I did see something with some friends of mine um, that we How were. Were you? We were like 16. Okay. You know, uh, we were we were actually we we liked to, okay. So first of all, we liked to go to the the local cemetery at night mm-hmm. and drive through because we're. We it's like to thing, do, dude. you know, we would try to do the thing where you touch all four corners uh, with a video camera on and actually, you know, something bad will happen or like we touched three of the corners at midnight. Right. And then the battery that was full on the camcorder, it just died or videotape thing. Anyway, mm-hmm. dating myself. It wasn't an iPhone, y'all. It was, it was, a, <laughs> it was one something of these. else. Yeah, right, it was, it was yeah. bigger. That's uh, how old I am. Um, but anyway, we, we pulled in VHS and there's, tape. yeah, the, the. The, the cemetery has three roads. Uh, there's a, a center road and two roads on the side, and there's a road along the back, right, that connects all three roads. We come in the center road, and as we're, we're, we're driving, we have the lights off so we can see, and we see a dude. Okay. And we all see him, all three of us, see this right. dude. And he runs from where we're at into the, into the cemetery, like uh, towards the, the middle part over on the right side, Mm-hmm. into the cemetery my buddy flips the lights on in the van we all hop out and we try to find this guy like we're all soccer players and, and athletes and we're, we're pretty fast right. right we can't find anything and then like later like we were all looking at each other we're like the lights the lights were off like how did we all see this dude as he was running through the the, the cemetery mm-hmm. like so clearly like we all saw this dude and it was that was like the, the clearest thing i ever saw but just like you know you're a kid weird feelings and and you think mm-hmm. you see stuff and yeah, and, you know, I'm a fairly like a empathetic person. I think you know, mm-hmm. and and you know, I you think feel stuff, to but that. like, yeah, you're sort of intuitive. But at a certain point, like that, that stuff, like at least visually, especially, kind of just goes away, or maybe you stop looking for it. I don't know kinda what like, it is. You know what it probably is, man. It, it's the whole tricks thing, dude. Tricks are for kids, right? And that's what kind of some of this stuff is for a lot of people probably i mean how many how many references can we make here from pop culture about this like you know kids believe in fairies tricks are for kids you know all these things that like as a child you know believing in santa claus right you know um like the end of the fucking polar express movie right the kid can hear the bell ringing his whole life but eventually he said his little sister stopped hearing the bell ring because she stopped believing right so maybe there is something to you know, children, I think there is, right? And there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of literature out there about why kids have these experiences because, like, they're closer to the veil, like you mentioned, right? They're they're younger. You know, it's also why they say, like, animals have experiences because they're more in tune, like, and they have, you know, different you know, sensory abilities than, than humans do, right? And so, I mean, maybe there is something to that. Like, as you get older, things stop being new, you know, you notice less because you're more complacent about things that go on. Like you have kids. I mean, you take my, I take my son out for walks and like the same bush that has those bees in it every day is like, it's new every day. It's like, he's seeing it for the first time again, every time, which is cool. But like, to me, it is what it is. You know, I've seen a million bushes with bees, you know? And so maybe there's a level of like adult complacency that goes into it and you just stop noticing. Yeah, but kids are weird too because they also do the thing like uh, my my daughter told her teacher that my wife was pregnant before we knew she she was pregnant, and Whoa. she said, "Mommy's gonna have my brother," and we were like, "What?" And then Dude. we had a boy, and uh, mom was pregnant, and it's like, well, how the a, a like I didn't know that you understood like it, it was weird. My daughter did something similar like that too with my son. And made a comment to her her babysitter about being excited for a baby brother. And same thing, dude. We're like, what? And then sure enough, dude, I have my son. And it's just it's just kind of weird. Kids do, man. And I had experiences too growing up like um, throughout my life, like certain things. And I've had experiences as an adult too. Adult too. Um, but my family has this. It's like a theme in it. Like my mom is audio voyant. Like she can hear things. Um, I'll give you an example. She went and visited a, a cemetery where a lot of my family members are buried. And she went specifically looking for a, a certain person. Couldn't find him. 
So she kind of gave up after a certain amount of time and was leaving the cemetery. And on her way out, she heard like in her ear, she heard, don't forget about me. And she said when that happened, she said she immediately knew where to look for um, this family member and was able to walk right to his headstone and did, you know. And so she's had experiences like that like her whole life and then um, my sister too. So who knows, man? Like there's a lot of things, um, a lot of things to that, like familial ties. And then there – I just saw there's like a study now about how some people's – like the cones in their eyes that perceive, you know – the light and pull it in and process his vision um that some people have uh the ability to see different like electromagnetic waves and not everybody has it and like that potentially that's why some of these people are able to see more of these things and um, some of these people are also maybe able to see you know craft like ufo craft uap craft that are maybe cloaking and like the, the people like you and I, you know, can't see them, but to them, they're able to. And so maybe there is some like physical aspect of that just because, because of it. But I do think that it is like, there is something to kids, like you said, right. And then some adults, it carries over and in, into that, you know, our adult lives. Um, and some people experience it their, their whole life, you know, but, um, you know, I'm trying to remember how we got off sort of on that, like rap, this rabbit trail, like to tie it back to it, but like, oh, the daughter mm-hmm. was 16. 16. The, she was 16. You know, that's interesting, too, because if you look at, like, um, poltergeist, one of the running theories, essentially, is that it's not actually something paranormal and that a lot of poltergeist activity centers around teenage girls and that or, – or sometimes – mostly teenage girls, but sometimes teenage boys. But that all of this, like – trauma that kids are going through about you know becoming adults throughout adolescence and the teenage years causes all this energy causes you know these things to happen things moving around the house thumping noises all this stuff and that basically it's just puberty essentially you know so it's sort of interesting too that their daughter is 16 because if you were um, a paranormal investigator going to investigate somebody's house for poltergeist activity and you found out they had a teenage daughter you'd be like in your head oh well you know what that actually might be the explanation yeah yeah it's just you know like if only one person saw something and it's a it's a teenager that's a and that's just something i thought of as, as we're going through it you know yeah like no, you that know, is. And, but I also think as we get older, we so we just start focusing on other people or on ourselves. You know, like uh, mm-hmm. I, I started using. True. I don't want to say gifts, right? But like you start just uh, focusing on other people and seeing what you can do, seeing what you can get away with. See, you know, like see if you can read people, see if you can do all these other things instead of, I don't know, instead of just being like out there. Yeah. No, it's true, man. Like you, you do become more in inner focused i guess especially teenagers you know you start doing that as an adult you want to impress other people and kids kids just don't care that's why they say like outlandish shit to people too right because they have no concept of decorum right so they'll just say whatever comes like what's wrong with your neck to a fat person you know what i mean which is a true story that happened to me Uh, (laughs) and um you know just do stuff like that you know they have no concept of it but um you know there could be there could be some weight to that with this situation with the Lily family and their daughter. But the crazy thing I think about all this shit is that it happened all within like the same month. And some of this stuff happened within the same week as these Mothman sightings and the eventual collapse of these things of that, of that bridge. Right. And that Mothman, these black eyed kids, injured cold, you know, some of the lore that they belong to are these sorts of like harbingers of tragedy or something bad happening to people. Or you have an experience with them and then something bad happens to you, right? Is it is it a chicken and egg thing though? So like I, I was thinking about this earlier. Like uh, it, are there certain times when like you can move through the dimensions better and if there is like a rift or a, or an opening uh, in a certain location for you to move freely throughout this thing. What does that do to our physical world mm-hmm. um, a- as they move through it? You know, like, does it cause cancer? Does it cause bridges to collapse? Does it do any of those other things? Or, or or do they move, you know, like, or, or is the impending doom, uh, you know, since time is relative, uh, does that allow the rifts in the dimension 
to occur before it. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I think that we just don't know, like, what would what's the cause and effect um, causation so, correlation thing there. So sort of like the Mothman comes through the dimension and whatever, like, interdimensional ripples it creates, it has some sort of effect on our plane and it causes those sorts of negative things is kind of what you're saying, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Or, or if, if, if the, the time thing is messed up, maybe if something bad is going to happen, you know, there's, there's like timelines associated with, you know, dimensional uh, tears or rifts or, or, or being able to pass through it. Mm-hmm. Um, like it, it, in their timeline, is that bad thing happening at the same time? Did it already happen? Or, you know what I mean? Like, cause yeah. if, if time is moving both ways or, or whatever is happening on the other side of the dimension, if they're time travelers, you know, um, maybe a, like a huge tragedy allows something to happen mm-hmm. yeah, or, or enough tragedy. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's an interesting way to look at it too. And even things like Mothman, um, there are other like sort of like cryptids, I guess you could call them and other cultures that act as like harbingers too of tragedy or something. You have an interaction with them and maybe you're going to have some sort of health issue or somebody, you know, is going to have a health issue, you know, and that's kind of come to be what this, you know, they think this could be is that potentially whatever it is like to, to your explanation on, you know, what it could be that this exists, not just in this silo of the Mothman being this, you know, harbinger, but that there's actually a theme throughout human history. Like Bigfoot actually is even supposedly one of these like harbingers of negativity to some people. And there's, okay. I mean, the, the, I mean, like we've talked on this, I've talked on this podcast before about how like Bigfoot is probably interdimensional and not, you know, some Australopithecus that somehow survived over millennia to still exist in the woods of the Pacific Northwest and the uh, the Indi or the uh, the Himalayan mountains, you know. So who, I mean, who knows, man? Yeah, I just think that there's so many weird, you know, I, I, and I, this all started with my my first thought of indie uh aliens could be stupid and so like it, you know like I, i'm trying to question every premise that we would have about anything in this this way right like the the assumption that time is is linear and only in a single direction it's like well we don't know how it works on the other side of that interdimensional veil you know what i mean yeah. um you know and and uh maybe they're harbingers maybe they're they're warning us or maybe stuff other stuff makes it through that as they come through, um, that, that causes bad things to happen. Um, and maybe they don't even realize that it's, they're causing harm, you know? And I was thinking earlier, like, it was funny cause you were saying kids say outlandish thing. Those, those black eyed kids, that kid probably didn't even know what gun meant. Like, imagine you're an interdimensional being and your research team that brings back data. Like, they're just like, these people are afraid of guns. they are like, what right. is a gun? I don't know yeah. what a gun is. And right. so it seems like a super odd thing to say to someone is like, I'm trying to put this person at ease. Hey, man, I don't have a gun. And we're like, that is the scariest thing you could say to somebody as you're trying to get into their car. But to them, they're just like, I don't understand this concept, but I'm going to say it like a yeah. child because it should make you feel better because I know people are scared of guns. I don't have one of those, you know, right. not even understanding the concept. Dude, just I, I'm like imagining like somewhere wherever on another planet or in another dimension, there's like a group of people and their entire job is just to prep the other inter, interdimensional beings to go to Earth. And they just have all this like half-assed information, probably antiquated, not all of it accurate because they're just observers and not actually participants, right? And they – like you said, dude, they're like – Okay, uh, Timmy and Tommy, you guys are gonna go, and you're gonna hang out at this this theater, and you're gonna go see Mortal. You're not. You're gonna go see Mortal Kombat, but you're not gonna go see Mortal Kombat. And the first motherfucker that comes through the parking lot, you're gonna walk up to him, and you're gonna get in their car, right? And you're gonna yeah. do whatever shit, because because black eyed kids, it's never anything positive. It's always something like really bad. Like people have described having incidents with them and then they develop like these crazy health conditions that like t- you know almost kill them, right? Um, and like that's sort of like the overarching theme with these with black eyed kids, B E K, that you're you could die. You start developing this insane amount of fear. But like <laughs> you're gonna get in their car and what you're gonna say is, I don't have a gun, right? And like, okay, I don't have a gun. 
Okay. Uh, telegram. Mm-hmm. Uh, newsboys hat and overalls. That's what I'll wear in 2023. You know, that's what they're wearing there. You know, it's just just kind of funny to think of that. Like when you think again, our preconceived notions of like aliens or like uh, interdimensional beings that they just fucking know everything, right? Like the idea that there's people on the other side just passing along misinfo. To the people coming across into our plane and they're trying to interact with us. I don't know. That's just fucking hilarious to me. It's just bad intel. Like when we went into, uh, you know, Iraq or, and even Afghanistan, especially Afghanistan, sure. and people are like, oh, it's the desert. It's not cold. It's like, huh? No, like, it's a mountain range just, here. <laughs> it's on our own planet. We have right. satellites at this time and right. we're telling people you don't need cold weather gear because you're going to the desert. Yeah. It's, it's. You know, like all these, we make huge mistakes and we should have all the data on, on stuff that we supposedly should understand. We don't understand their culture. I mean, we effed that whole place up because we don't understand tribal culture. We don't understand that the the country of Afghanistan is not actually a country. It was just lines drawn by Western powers in between, you know, the, the, it's a buffer between, uh, Pakistan and Russia and, you know, like, and, and someone else for someone else to fight with and to hate. And it's, we don't understand humans and we expect these interdimensional that's or alien point, creatures dude. to understand humans it's it's mm-hmm. insanity yeah dude that's a great point like because we you know again we don't even understand one another we didn't learn the lessons from the russians being in afghanistan the first time made a bunch of the same mistakes that they did even though we basically you know funded a war for the mujahideen to take them out didn't learn any sort of lessons to piss all those people off when we fu- finally got rid of the russians there and then just left them with nothing except a bunch of weapons right that we yeah. tried to buy back from them when we started going going back you know got rid of all these people in the intel com- community that spoke all these dialects and shit and then no one knew what the fuck was going on yeah dude i mean human beings kind of suck at that shit so it makes sense somebody from another dimension wouldn't know what the fuck is going on either yep yeah, I remember being in Afghanistan reading a book uh, that was written by a Russian dude that had been in Afghanistan and just being like, this is insanity. Was it's it the, the bear, came, bear Came Over the Mountain or Bear Went Over the Mountain? Yeah. Dude, that, yeah. I read that book. That's a good book, uh, actually. I read it in country, and I'm just like, this mm-hmm. is wild. This is right. We're doing the same stuff. Yep. Dude, speaking of spooky shit, I've seen like stories of uh, people like hearing like Russian come across like their fucking radios and shit at night. And, you know, hearing like Russian being spoken, you know, in the middle of the night and like hearing screams and shit. And, you know, supposedly those being like the imprints of the gun battles the Russians had with the Afghanis like way back during the Cold War. Oh, yeah. It's probably like the same on like Iwo Jima and all those places, you know, like. Bro, speaking of shit and experiences you had, I had as a kid when I was my dad was stationed at Yakota. Um, I was in Boy Scouts on base, and we would go to Camp Tama for camping all the time. And Tama, Tama Hills, if you have you ever been there? Nope. So it was an old um, Imperial Army, Japanese Imperial Army base during World War II. And the mission at Tama was making munitions, like in bombs and stuff like that. So they have all of these like grass bunkers and, you know, underground tunnels and shit there uh, in Tama. And they kind of, they probably tell you this shit just to like kind of scare you because you're all like middle school kids, you know what I mean? Then there's all these like Japanese Boy Scouts there too. But like, I remember one of the ones we had, you know, was basically telling us like, you know, like it's legit. Like at night you can hear like people pushing like wagons and there there's metal you can hear being moved in these wagons. And he's like, if you go over here at night, he's like, there's a potential you're going to see a Japanese ghost, you know, who died here because there was an explosion over at this part of the camp, you know, during World War II. Somebody made a mistake and his munitions went off, right? And um, so it's just kind of, I don't know, there's all these experiences I had because of that. But it, it does, it gets left behind all these battlefields like Gettysburg and all these things, you know, that people go and they see these imprints of ghosts. They hear, you know, like, you know, uh, flutes and drums and gunshots and can of fire and people dying in agony, like these just stuff you hear like randomly. And, um, it's just kind of funny, dude. Like we don't understand. It makes me think of like, to to your point, dude, like we don't even understand one another human to human. We don't understand like cultures. We don't understand, you know, anything like that. So like there's this whole other aspect of us that seems to kind of 
continue after you're not here that we definitely don't understand even though there is kind of like physical evidence of it that you're you can point to and say like hey look like something lingers afterwards right and not even talking about in a religious sense because obviously like religion you know you have like christianity you believe in and you know the afterlife in heaven and there's all these other things that go into it but like um there's this whole other aspect of humanity that we don't understand and there's almost and if, I, I think it's kind of going away more now as as time goes on but there's almost this sort of like willful willful ignorance about not wanting to know what it is from a large group of people like just not wanting to know like the uh the history or the imprinting or no like not all of it not wanting to like um acknowledge that there is an afterlife so to speak and that some of the scary shit that happens to people is actually real and then maybe not being so derogatory to them about like what they experience because it really just kind of plays on your own personal fear of what comes next kind of thing. Yeah. Well, it's like that comedian was saying, right? Like he's like, you got the people that believe in nothing and then you've mm-hmm. got the people that believe in God. Mm-hmm. He's like, so nothing created this. And then yeah. when we die, we go back to nothing. So it was like, so you return to the thing that created you just like right. heaven, you know, like it's, it's all the same theory. Right but on diff- different levels of narcissism. That's really yeah. what it is. No, for sure, dude. It, it's just like kind of this thing where it's like, um, there's no, there's no atheists in foxholes. You know, yeah. I don't think that there's no. There really is truly somebody who is completely and totally atheist. I think everybody is some brand of agnostic in some way, shape, or form, um, and that I, I, I do think that it's probably in an an innate thing in us as people and that's just more prominent in other people and then obviously like your upbringing will have a lot to do with like what you believe you know and then the region in which you grew up in is going to have a lot to do with what you believe um and personal experiences but like i do i think it's just like one of these things where people have this this fear of the unknown so they discredit these experiences that other people have or this these things you can point at that to, to our point about like the battlefields and you know, these experiences that U.S. soldiers had, like hearing Russian ghosts and stuff like that, that people don't want to acknowledge it because it's scary. Do you think that it's the inanimate objects that get imprinted or do you think it's something in our DNA that gets passed along that is part of like a collective human experience? I think that there is like some sort of energy. I don't know what to call it. Maybe like an energy field that exists and that we're all just kind of a part of, you know, the idea of like God is everywhere. God is everything. And that that energy is what it is. And that something traumatic, like a battle happens and it leaves behind those imprints or, you know, cause there's, there's a whole lot of speculation too, that you can do about like what ghosts are that interact with people, you know, are they actual human spirits or are they demonic or whatever? But I do think that there are objects that can absorb energy. Like you can, it's a measurable thing. You know, certain certain rocks like granite or whatever can absorb energy better than others. So think think of it this way: like you, if you go if into your bathroom, right? Your bathroom is the same. It's the same temperature in your bathroom. It's sixty. Let's say it's like sixty-seven degrees in your bathroom. If you go to touch the um, the metal faucet, it's going to feel colder than if you go and touch the wooden cabinet because of the way that your metal faucet and the difference between it and the wooden cabinet displaces heat. Right. So, um, it's just, it's kind of, does that make sense? Like kind of what I'm getting at? Yeah. 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 So like, I mean, I, I was just thinking like, you know, like we don't understand the the a lot of things in nature about like how animals know where they're at how bees return to their hive you know like the 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 electromagnetic waves that they pick up and so like i think there might be like if there's like a something that happens and there's a shift in the Mm -hmm. you know energy of that area you know does that turn something on in our dna that we already have there or or do we react to it in a certain way so are we actually seeing things or is it just um uh, our reaction uh to the energy you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Dude, um, you know, I think it's probably both, dude. I think it 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 happens. You you pick up on it, 
and you're able to see it and not everybody is, maybe it ties back into that, you know, thing we were talking about before, how not everybody is able to, or that as you get older, you sort of lose that ability to, I think that it's probably always there. And there's probably nowhere on this earth that doesn't have some sort of like leftover energy from something because it doesn't matter like wherever you go, like there's going to be a story about something like there's a road near Simbok in Germany and supposedly there was like a battle that happened there between um, some a Germanic tribe and some Romans. And you, you could apparently every once in a while, you know, it was reported that you would see a Roman soldier walking around near the road there and it was like a german thing like the germans told each other this and so of course like it made its way to like the americans living in the area but like no matter where you go you know gettysburg right and Tidum, you know it, it just the tudorberg forest you know all these places where there's just these crazy traumatic experiences or even like people's ha- people's homes dude like I'll t- you want to know some some scary ass shit dude this is actually yeah. really fucking weird okay so when I, I was at I was at Malmstrom for for eight years, okay, there was the entire time I was there, there was one house that had three suicides in it, and um, obviously the first time I went to this house that had this suicide, like it's like it is what it is, you know what I mean? And I, over time, I realized that somebody else moved into this house, and so I'm driving around, I see this, I'm like, I wonder if those people know that a woman killed herself in this house. They probably don't. I have no idea if, if Balfour Beatty, it has to disclose that there was a death in this house. Right. But then, but then somebody else killed themselves in that house. And I'm like, yo, that is really, really weird. Okay. That that happened twice. And so now, you know, and then the other people that like I work with, like we know now that there's been two suicides in this one house and um, I'll just say – I won't say the house number, but I will say if you're listening to this and you live at Malstrom, it's on Fuchsia Street. Um, oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everybody living on Fuchsia Street is like, fuck, is it my house? We're um, out of here. Right, dude. And um, and then near the end of my time there, somebody else killed themselves in that house. And um, all three of them were women that killed themselves if somebody's spouse. Um, and uh, I just – I wonder, dude. Like that to me – like once is random, twice is a coincidence, three times is a pattern, right? Like what the hell is going – I would be curious, right, But if it happened again. But it makes me wonder like what – is it the leftover energy from these dead women that is just like playing on the other woman that moves in there that she kills herself and then now there's two dead women that kill themselves in this house – and now the third woman is like somehow overcome by this energy that's in the house and she kills herself. Like, is that a thing? But it happened. That's a true story. Three separate women over the span of eight years killed themselves in the same house on base. And they still move people into this house, dude. Like, I mean, they obviously got to f- you would think at some point they'd be like, OK, that's enough. You know, if, <laughs> this if house is off. They would have torn it down. Yeah, right. That's what I'm getting at. Like, but of course, like the the private housing company wants their money. You know what I mean? But you would think, dude, like there somebody has to eventually a address this as like, you know what? People do. We can we'll just close this house down and not acknowledge the the creepy shit that happened there and just write it off as condemned for whatever reason and not address like the supernatural aspect of this. You know, but they still move people in. It makes me wonder, man. Well, and it's, it's, is it the house or is it, you know, that weird... That's what I'm getting you at. You know, everybody's floating down the river of life and a certain people vibe a certain way and they hit that rock and they just happen to float over to that side and end up in that house, you know, Dude. like... Oh, like, is life guiding guiding people towards this house kind of thing? Because, like, yeah. your, your thoughts and your emotions are sort of just, like, leading you towards whatever you're thinking. Like, how do your thoughts become reality sort of thing? Like, are these three couples following the same path through life it would seem similar so. things that are happening you know like or something's in the house and uh, we need to tear no, that, that down and burn burn the ashes you know like that's kind of that's kind of what i was wondering dude. I, I i'd always wondered dude and every time i drove by this house i would just like stare at it like kind of half ass mm. expecting to see some dark entity looking at me through the front window or some shit you know and like it's montana too so like how much of this is like Indian burial ground or whatever that we don't know about, you know, but I don't know. It is just, that's, 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 
that's a fact. Like that shit happened there over the span of eight years, you know. And I've always wondered about that. If like, what is it? You know, is it is it a spirit there? Is there some sort of evil on the ground? Is it, you know, the what first woman? She just happened to have enough shit going on in her life that she took her life, and now she's like haunting it and affecting the other people that move in. I don't know. One, it was it like mid G watt too? Is it just the ops tempo was insane and people are just offing themselves all over the place? Well, you got to think about it, man. It's Malmstrom, right? So it's it's the missile field. So the yeah. the first off, there's not a a ton of deployments going out of there. The security forces group isn't deploying because they're all in the missile field. So really, the only people that deployed with any amount of frequency at Malmstrom is was Red Horse. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of problems with Red Horse I could tell you about, but like they, they weren't, I don't think any of the people that lived in that, I know one of them was a security forces family. Um, but I don't think the other two were, were Red Horse. I know they weren't security forces families, but one of them was, Mm -hmm. one of them was a security forces family. Not sure, man. It's a, it's a weird one. Yeah. I mean, you know, you see these things happen and you can, you can just chalk it up to statistics, right? Eventually. At some point in the world, there are going to be three families in a row where mm-hmm. someone commits suicide, you know, just right. based on the billions of people that are cycling through this life. But like, it's also weird and it's mm-hmm. Malmstrom. So like, that's a depressing place anyway. Uh, so indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, yeah. I actually, I don't want to change the subject, but I kind of do. And we could, we can link it into this a little bit. Please do. I have a question about JFK. Okay. So everybody that's been president since JFK and a bunch of them have said like, Hey, like I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell people what actually happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, was it Trump or was it Clinton? One of them said like, Hey, I saw the stuff. And if you saw what I saw, you wouldn't tell people either. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, what if, what if Kennedy deserved it? Whoa, man, that is a, I've never heard anybody posit that that way. I think you're talking about Clinton. Because I remember, I remember, think I remember seeing Obama talk about that on a on a like one of the Tonight shows or whatever, where he said that you know Clinton just basically gave the company line about it. Um, but um, did Kennedy deserve it, dude? That is, I think that depends on your perspective, right? Because if you consider like the things going on when Kennedy became president, right? So he started all of this shit with. What was this? You know, what would become the CIA? What was the CIA, right? The yeah. Bay of Pigs thing. He he didn't want anything to do with Vietnam, right? He, I mean, definitely did not make friends with Alan Dulles, who is probably one of the most evil men in American history. Okay, yep. so from my perspective, do I think he deserved it? No, I don't think he deserved it, but. Like, this question makes me... Here's how I interpret your question. Was he killed because he was a national security threat, right? Is that kind of like the angle you're coming at? Or Well, well so we hear the two sides of the story, right? We hear the, the Kennedy was a good guy. Um, and, and it's easy to believe, right? Because like, this is what we've heard our entire lives. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying really hard to come out of like the, the, the haze of my childhood still in certain things and, and approach things... In a way that it's like, what is what is the the objective truth of this situation? And and, and I, I think probably most of what I think about Kennedy is probably correct, right? Like mm-hmm. I don't probably think he deserved it. But I was just thinking the other day, I was like, what if like how much do we actually know about JFK? We know that he wasn't an a hundred percent moral man. You Definitely know, he not. had shortcomings. He had all these mm-hmm. other things. And then what what year did he die? You know, um, sixty three, pretty sure. Right. So like. This is kind of before or around the time that a lot of this alien stuff started happening as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of people that kind of jumped in there to cover it up. And yes, he had pissed off a lot of people. But I'm like, what if what if he was trying to sell us out to the aliens? You know, like and I, and I started to try to be funny about it. I'm like, what if what if they were hot aliens? What if what, what, who what was Marilyn Monroe? Who was the Marilyn you know? Monroe of the alien were the, world? Were there some alien babies? You know, is a is, is RFK? Uh, is he, how did he really lose his voice, or did the piece that that modulates his voice makes him sound like a human did a break, <laughs> and that right. the replacement parts are eighty eight billion light years away? You know, like could be, who knows? Uh, but I, I was just it, thinking, like, what 
the, the, you know, it could be this evil conspiracy, but like, I, I just wanted to approach it from another angle because I'm trying is like, what if, you know, what if he was into some seriously evil shit? And like, it, what if, what if we really are better off because he got assassinated? Dude, that is the question that I've never heard anybody ask. Like, what if, you know, to your point, man, like, there is so much stuff that you could point out that you could say is like a net positive, right? Like avoiding nuclear war with Russia, the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, definitely a net positive. But like what if, you know, all of these things that he wanted to stop and these things he wanted to get America out of would have been a net negative for everybody? And we just don't know. And it's kind of like one of these things was like. When somebody dies, right, a, a celebrity, there's sort of this cult of personality that develops. It's kind of like fucking Jimmy Carter right now, right, with all this. Like, like the, the left is sort of like propping up Carter as this, like, amazing human being. And he, you know, he, and for all intents and purposes, he's a good guy. But he's a terrible fucking president, right? Right. But there's this cult of personality around him now because there's enough distance between when he was president and today that – all anybody thinks about or talks about is he's the peanut farmer from Georgia who has a great soul and wants to vote for the first female president, you know. But it kind of happens. Like Kurt Cobain killed himself. This cult of personality around him, you know. And Nirvana, you know, it skyrocketed their, their music into greatness forever. You know, would that have happened if Kurt Cobain didn't kill himself? But to the point with what you're saying, like if JFK wasn't assassinated – definitely the way we look at him now in retrospect would be a lot different than the way he's looked at today. I would say that everything that the extramarital affairs that he had as a, as a husband, right, would be talked about probably more prominently. I think some of the Kennedy family ties into how they made their money, you know, through conflicts in American history would be talked about more. And it would just sort of his his death sort of took a lot of that stuff off the table because he was a casualty in history, right? And you talk about like civil rights in that era. You talk about Vietnam. You talk about what was going on in Cuba. You talk about, you know, the military industrial, um, uh, you know, uh, Jesus Christ complex. complex. Yeah. And all of that shit that's going on, you know, was going on at that time. It removes all that negative shit from being talked about. It's almost taboo to say like, oh, yeah, well, Kennedy was actually kind of a piece of shit because he was mailing Marilyn Monroe in the White House Oval Office bathroom when Jackie was taking care of the kids or whatever, you know? Yeah. What if he would have sold us out to the Russians? You know, you never know. I mean, that was that's kind of like was a fear, though, when you think about it, because he didn't want to have a conflict with with the Russians. He didn't want to have conflict in, in Vietnam. He didn't want to do anything like that. Maybe... You know, who knows, right? Would the Russians have used his willingness to be friends against us, right, to sort of exact their own, uh, you know, whatever plans they had and just sort of take advantage of his kindness and his openness to be friends? And then it would have had a negative outcome for Americans, you know, in the future. Like it's kind of like that 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 TV sh series that came out. I can't remember what it's called, but basically the Russians beat the United States to the moon, right? You know what I'm talking about? For what's it called? Whatever. You know what I'm the talking about? The Man in the High Castle. No, that's that was the one where about we if, lost that was World where, War Two. That was where. Yeah. No, this one. Um, I can't remember what this one's called. I have to look it up again. But like, what if his sort of willingness to be? Uh, you know, more humanitarian type of president, right? And, and instead of, you know, ramping up through the Cold War, wanted to just, you know, de-escalate, would have meant that the United States got taken advantage of. And then all of these things that we now enjoy as Americans wouldn't have happened because of what he did. And that really, Lee Harvey Oswald and whoever the fuck else actually shot at Kennedy that day did us all a favor in the grand scheme. That's a crazy thought, dude. Just throwing it out there. No, um, I love that. Uh, now I like now now I want to do a whole fucking what if podcast on that question. I'm just gonna like get somebody who's an expert in all of that and be like, all right, man, like all these conspiracies, cool, we can talk about them. But tell me why him getting fucking whacked was a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Maybe it was. I mean we don't and and, and the reason the, the way I got here was I I was putting together a list of like social conditioning things that I that I you know, we've all dealt with through our childhoods. Mm -hmm. Um and I kinda started with I remember you remember that movie The Burbs with Tom I Hanks? Love the Burbs, yes. 
But remember, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was the movie where Tom Hanks was like, and it was kind of being funny, uh, but he said, um, you know, like, I'm a good guy. I pay my taxes. Mm-hmm. And even as a child, I was like, why are we making a moral equivalency to paying taxes and being a good person? And, and when was the first time that that was used in movies? You know what I mean? I'm Ooh, like, what, what, are we, what are we, we trying to condition the, the next generation to believe? And you heard it, and, and I started noticing that you hear it in, in especially like 80s, 90s uh, media mm-hmm. a lot. I'm a good guy. I pay my taxes. You know, like it was, it was, they were linked is, is me being a, a good, upstanding, moral citizen and paying my taxes the way that I should. I don't cheat on my taxes, you know, much. Mm-hmm. And they, they'd use humor about it as well. Uh, but I started making like a list of, of things that we were socially conditioned uh, to believe uh, through media. And then, I, you know, like you sort of start to question everything else. Like, was, was Nixon really a, a terrible president? Because we only hear one thing about Nixon, right? That too. And, yeah. and was, was JFK really a, a great president? You know, uh, I, we all know that getting dirt on that guy would have been incredibly easy. And, and, yeah. and, and, and turning him into an asset, whether he was willing or not, um, w- wouldn't have been that hard, you know, mm-hmm. by honeypotting that guy and, and a whole bunch of other things that you could have done uh, with him. So, just, just got me asking questions. It could be one of those things where they tried to take all these things about Kennedy that are negative and he wouldn't play ball. You know, he's like, I don't care. Fucking blow me up about Marilyn Monroe and whoever the hell else he was doing. You know, he's like, I'm going to keep doing what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do these things that I want to do when it comes to my presidency and legislating and, and all of that. And they just were like, nope, fuck it. That's it. And just fucking took him out, dude. Like, I mean, it's very plausible. Yeah. And, and you got to consider, you know, Alan Dulles basically decided that, well, all of this power you took away from me and all of this sort of downsizing you did in the intelligence community during this time, like, I'm just going to put all these people back to work, but I'm going to do it secretively and you have, you have no fucking idea about it. And he did that, you know? Yeah. And, and I'm going to run the investigation about your assassination. It, exactly. Which, right. Y- and, even though I'm not technically a, a, an employee of the government anymore, they're mm-hmm. going to bring me back in. Right. It is kind of crazy when you read about the Dulles brothers and just how power hungry they were. Like that, do you ever read that book, Devil's Chessboard? No, you should. That's a dude. That's a scary book, but um, it's it's all about Alan Dulles. Um, but no, I mean like one hundred percent. At some point, Kennedy became the enemy, and I think that it really just has everything to do with that person's ego, and then just his desire overwhelming desire for power and control over things and then wanting to wanting america to be the america that he envisioned it for himself where did america start to go that direction with like with the 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 entire like america should run everything i think that that i think that that came out after world war ii really I mean, because at that point, the United States was the kind of the only superpower left. I mean, that that term superpower, you know, isn't something that's been used for a very long time. It's not. It's kind of relatively new in the grand scheme of things. And America was kind of the only the only country left that wasn't in, in complete and total shambles after World War Two. Right. Like the UK had a lot to recover France definitely did Italy, the whole Middle East, you know, obviously J- Japan is, uh, was recovering. <laughs> uh, yeah. A rough. Sorry guys. Yeah. And the Germany, obviously, you know, all the sanctions and, and everything, the aftermath of, you know, the United States occupying Germany and all that stuff. So I think that's really when it began is like this, this idea of, well, now we're, now we're the only people at the top of, you know, this, this global gang of game of King of the Hill, and we're, the, we're at the top of the hill, so we're going to do what we want. And I think that you had – so like the OSS was supposed to be disbanded after World War II, right? And, and it wasn't, you know, not to the degree that it was intended to be disbanded. You know, the, the gang got back together. And I just think that this desire for control and this knowing we can get away from it, that like a- pa- absolute power corrupts absolutely is the answer to this question, right? But that yep. all of these people that were assembled to essentially guarantee that the United States was going to win the war and learn all this secret shit about the enemy and you know use it against them and and win this conflict didn't go away because 
why do we need permission to do this? We've been doing all this shit already without permission, you know? Yeah. Well, it begs the question, and, and it's my follow-up, and this is going to go to a place that is uncomfortable maybe. Um, how much negative media have you seen about the United States in World War II? I mean, the the past couple months, there's been more, um, and I think that that is... A little bit. I think, yeah, that's. I think that that's has a almost everything to do with the whole October 7th and uh, Hamas and Israel thing, right? Yeah. But not a lot, man. I mean, that, that phrase, you know, history is written by the victors is, is absolutely the truth, you know? Um, but there isn't a lot, dude. It, 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 there really isn't any sort of real negative press. Maybe well, maybe you... with the atomic bombs, right? There's negative. That's, that's an aspect that you can say, bit. yeah, that there's a negative press with that for sure. But other than that, yeah. But if you were going to sigh up an entire country to convince them that their place in the world was important and their role in the world was brought about by their heroic actions, mm -hmm. and you call an entire generation of people the greatest generation, greatest generation, and you start saying that we're a superpower, we are a force for good, we were attacked first, mm -hmm. and we were in the right, and we, we did all these correct things and we stopped the Holocaust, you know, and, and, and the Japanese are, are terrible people and all we're going to hear is negative stuff about them. Mm -hmm. Like there's an entire generation of people that grew up believing that everything that they did was righteous and that America was yes. like this force for global good that it just had not. That was not the identity of the United States before that. Mm -mm. And then, and, you, know, you know, I see this kind of creep into, you know, and then. Once the CIA starts up and then you kind of see, you know, the early Hollywood, it seemed like a lot of it was kind of anti-government. You know, at least there was there was some of that. And at a certain point, everything just kind of like shifted. And then well, to, the, the, the cultural conditioning began. To your to your point about the movies, right? Think of It's a Wonderful Life. Like, who's the bad guy in that movie? It's it's the banker. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like whatever the the actor's name escapes me but more no it's not more and more brewster that's from an uh, arsenic and old lace but the main character of it's a wonderful life he owns a bank too a, a loan or whatever it is and he is willing to put himself in the hole for his fellow man and that's a theme in that movie but then it, it changes over time you know and it becomes what you said there's this moral equivalency to doing your your duty to the government essentially and yeah. it's it's that more it's that mental conditioning and I would say even further, right, the boomer generation that grew up, you know, they all grew up believing what you just said, that the government, the U.S. government was the greatest thing, the American government or the American country was the, was the greatest thing. So there's no sort of questioning really about what's going on until like the civil rights era. And even then after that, like it never really stopped, you know, it kind of increased after that. But these people grew up thinking, I mean, even now, like, you know, I don't know how old your parents are, right? I'm sure you mean you're Gen X, so your parents are probably, probably boomers, maybe, you know what yeah. I mean? But like, I know a lot of boomers have a hard time hearing anything negative about the United States. It's almost, you are questioning, it's not even almost, you 100% are questioning their entire worldview, right? Yep. To suggest that maybe we're the bad guys in some of this stuff because you had people like Alan Dulles who had no other interest at heart other than self-interest and the desire for power and control, right? And that's why some of these decisions were made to do some of the things that we were doing, right? You know, we're going to get involved in these conflicts. We're going to go after this person. We're going to go after this, you know, this group of people or whatever, right? And don't get me wrong. Like a lot of these people that the United States went after were terrible human beings like this the, to go to bet we were saying before this cult of personality that's in in enshrouded che guevara after his death like totally oh a piece gosh. of shit person right yeah. but like that's why that shit exists is what i'm getting at is like you know because because there is all this other stuff to point at you know with with the world power that's wrong and we know all this information now it's just easier to not question the narrative uh-huh yeah yeah it's just as you as you look at it through history, it's funny. And then I started to break down kind of like what I would be, what I had been socially conditioned, and what what I see in media, you know. And and, and it's funny too. I came to a conclusion. It doesn't take a lot of the media, mm -mm. like it only takes like ten percent of it for like certain things. 
And um, if, if, I have a, a, like a list of things real quick, if you don't mind. No, um, I don't mind at Or all. some of them we can go through. Uh, Please. But well, first one is, is the question, is, is in a dystopian or, or post-apocalyptic or even like that new movie, The Civil War, like what are we conditioned to think about fellow Americans if, mm-hmm. if things go to crap? Well, right now, dude, I mean, we're very much conditioned to think that the left is evil or the right is evil, first and foremost. Yeah. That is has been completely and totally successful, and it didn't even take that long. Like, obviously, historically, Republicans and Democrats have disagreed with one another. But I would say really 2016 is when that those differences became more than differences and became like – violent aggression at one another so there is absolutely i think an effort to sort of villainize the other half of americans and it's very successful it has been very successful and i think that there are these tertiary effects that have happened because of this and i think the goal was to try to get people to vote one way or the other but i think it had way worse consequences than maybe the intent was even though that intent wasn't good right at all it's not good pit to pit people one against one another and this is a tale as old as time pitting one group of people against one another right yeah but i think the tertiary there are tertiary effects that were not accounted for that now were probably not going to be able to come back out of for a long period of time right what, I mean, you think they weren't accounted for? You think that wasn't the goal? I think it was the goal to divide people, but I almost I don't want to give these people enough credit to say that the goal was eventual violence. And I don't mean like just like onesie twosie violence. I mean like full blown civil war level violence. Well, yeah, but well, I think the media is trying to condition us to believe that our neighbors given the opportunity would be violent towards us. I like, agree you look at like the, the, the purge movies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I equate that to like the war on drugs in a weird way where okay. the, the argument that if you, if you legalized all drugs, then everybody would be doing heroin tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the same argument that if all crime was legal for a night, the entire city would be out there schwacking their neighbors. Yeah. Uh, I think they're, that they're trying to convince us that, um, your, your, your fellow Americans, the regular citizens are not good people. And that if things do go wrong, the only per- people you can trust are, are that you can't reach is the, is the government, right? Like mm-hmm. if, if yeah. it goes badly, all these crazy people in the country, no matter which side of the aisle they fall on, we're all going to be trying to kill each other. And yeah. is that not the, the lesson in, in, in a lot of these movies? I mean, you know, when you put it that way, you're right because... If you're going to replace the trust that the American people have in one another with something else, when you create the problem, you have to already have the solution ready to just slide across the table and say, here's how we fix this, right? And getting people to distrust one another and then reaffirm some of their um, beliefs and sort of give them like a by proxy proximity to, to authority, because of the government um, sort of gives people like the moral high ground in their own mind. And that makes it really easy to begin othering people. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, all signs sort of, I mean, maybe there is, you know, a group of, I I don't even want to say maybe, because I do think there's a group of people that want that sort of thing, because that is a, efficient way of doing business when you want the government to have total control. Do I think that the pawns in the middle of this, right? The the journalists and the mouthpieces for these politicians are thinking that way? Probably not. Um, but I do think that they are a part of that scheme, whoever this ethereal they is that exists, right? Um, exacting all of this on us as their victims in this conquest for authoritarian government, right? Right. Either they're trying to convince us to start the violence or they're trying to convince us that without their solutions, Mm -hmm. we will descend into 
straight anarchy. Like the the idea that if the federal government stopped doing everything except for national defense tomorrow, mm-hmm. that the American people would fall to pieces, mm-hmm. that our society would collapse, right. which is is objectively untrue. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's the idea, you know. And if if you don't have that, uh, they're convincing us that without that, without that infrastructure from up high, then neighbors are going to be killing neighbors and mm-hmm. like, you know, all that other stuff. And I, I think that's that that's the end lesson of a lot of these movies is to make us feel unstable in our communities. Well, I would ask you this question: When you go out into your neighborhood, is that the experience you have that you feel like your neighbors? don't trust you anymore or do you have a different experience i feel well no my neighborhood's pretty pretty cool Mm -hmm. you know like my my direct neighbors you know like everybody kind of within like five or six houses of me that i know we're all pretty cool with each other and we you know if something happens in the neighborhood we're all out front talking about it and and problem solving and and i know not all of them think the same way i do you know Mm -hmm. politically Sure. Um, but but we we're trying to get rid of that, you know what I mean, and 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 to tend to think that your experiences uh, would would you know resonate throughout the entire country. That's another thing that we try to do, right? Like all these things, like red blue red states, blue states, like they're totally different. North, south, east, west, all this other stuff. Uh, don't don't mention the fact that anytime there's a natural disaster that happens, whether the government is actually there to to provide assistance or not, the local populace and people from all over the country. Uh, Americans are still the most generous people on the face of the planet. Mm-hmm. They're they're flying stuff in and they're going stuff in and they're you know moving stuff in and they're helping out. They're risking their own lives. They're donating you know time, money, effort, resources uh, to help their fellow Americans. But For they sure. don't. That's not. I don't think that's what they want. You can't control a whole bunch of people that feel secure with the rest of their people. Mm-hmm. No, I mean a- absolutely, dude. Like you, you have to go in and start fomenting distrust and you have to go in and start giving people things that they can point at whether they're real or just smoke screens right and say this is why i distrust that person you know and i think it's it's interesting that you say that that's your experience because it's and this could just be 100 percent because i live in a suburb of sacramento okay but um you know i've had enough conversations with my neighbors to know that i'm like the lone the lone, you know, Republican pretty much within like a four or five house radius. Okay. Right. And, um, I definitely get treated. I get ignored pretty often. You know, the, the conversations I have with people are pretty short and to the point, even if I try to like have a conversation to get to know them, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, so it could just be that, you know, maybe where I live. And I, and there are like, I do live in like somewhat Northern California and I do see like Trump flags and stuff like that, you know, around my neighborhood, just as much as I see like Harris Waltz flags, which is really weird to me um, to see that just cause like, I don't know. I didn't see Biden Harris flags back in 2020, but um, you know, it just, at least out here, maybe some of that programming works a lot more because when you consider the group of people who were all about snitching on their neighbor during covid and being the the quote-unquote teacher's pet about masks and social distancing and all that stuff right it was really one half of the aisle and i don't like to generalize generalize too too much but like there are groups of people Right. And that's factual. That is observably true. And one half of these people were all about that, that um, sense of proximity to authority that I was talking about before, because the government, they agreed with whatever the government was saying and the other half didn't. So there was this almost moral high ground that they adopted because of that. And I think people forget even like the the right half of the country who who didn't have the moral high ground in that situation right if it was suddenly flipped i think that those people would do the same thing for whatever it is right if the moral high ground now belonged to you probably more people you know a lot of people would still do kind of the same thing in whatever whatever facet it was going on but i think there would be less people like that on that half than the other half does that make sense what i'm getting at yeah yeah Mm -hmm. i mean i just i think one side has a few more free thinkers 
um, mm-hmm. people that are willing to take one side is, is riskier than the other, <clears throat> which requires yeah. uh, a little more confidence in yourself, a little less fear based uh, reality uh, yeah. outlook on reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's all it is. But I will say there is there's nothing and this side note, nothing more infuriating uh, than meeting someone who who on the surface agrees with me on most things, mm-hmm. but they don't actually know why they agree. You know, like. Like I, I like I and I meet educated people that disagree with me on a lot of stuff, and I get how they kind of got to their conclusions. They're wrong, sure. you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but like at least we can have like conversations, and they 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 have some principles, and they took a few wrong steps, whatever. Mm-hmm. When I meet ignorant people that supposedly share the same values that I do, mm-hmm. it, I don't know why that bothers me so much. You know, like the 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 people that make the same mistakes that I see people on the other side making, making the same mistakes on my side. Um, and I'm just like, you know, like a, a single person at the federal government level is still not supposed to be your Messiah. You Ever. know, you're supposed to be about individual freedom. Like you claim to like hold the same values I do, but you're still asking the federal government to take more power and to, to do more instead of mm-hmm. doing less. Like you're not actually mm-hmm. trying to shrink the government. You, no. you know, like you just, you believe in the, this side of big government, federal government, mm-hmm. and the other side believes in this side of big, big federal government. Exactly. And, and you want to say you, you agree with me, but you don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do I think the reason why that frustrates you, it's, it's funny you say this, because I was just having a conversation with my wife about something similar this morning. And I think the reason why it drives you nuts is because you have a, a level of care for this country and you feel like that you can demonstrably show why these ideals and why this these ways of thinking are better because they preserve the principles you're talking about, like you know sovereignty, um, not to do whatever it is you want to do, but to do what you ought to do and take responsibility for your life and figure out ways to live independently from government, which is what you should be doing, right? And you watch people think the solution is the problem right because it's just like oh well we've got all these problems well let's give more power to the government to fix the problems the government created it's like you're a fucking idiot like what are you doing bro like just let's take a step back from from this for a second we both supposedly care to your point about what happens in this country except you don't see how you're just letting the virus encroach more and more into your life because you just happen to agree to agree with this flavor right now. Right. But eventually it comes for you too, you know, and you get frustrated because you know where it's heading because maybe you pay attention historically to things or, you know, you, and let's just be real, dude. Like you don't think the same as somebody who was it was in special operations as the normal person like you are trained in specific ways to recognize patterns and there are patterns to some of these things as they develop and you just have more critical thinking skills it's kind of like i mean not to not to chastise too much but it's kind of like trying to explain something to your toddler and they just don't get it or your small child and they just don't get it and you're like how don't you get this you know and you yeah. kind of have to like Obviously, there's a this it's totally different because you have to have patience and you're teaching somebody something. But like, it almost feels that way. It's like, wait, no, no, like you don't need the government to provide a solution for you. Like, here's what you can do, and they're like, no, uh, nope, not me, not me. Yeah. You know, and it's just like my team is in charge, so they can do nothing wrong. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. GW is a conservative. Right. It's like what? Wh- huh? Like, yeah, I mean, okay. I, I tried to have this conversation with a dude down range one time, and he was like, just nothing would conservative not have about, about, it. about GW. And the, I mean, I who we were just talking to somebody on the podcast about this. Like, when was the last time we had a president that you could say was actually fiscally conservative? Coolidge, it's been a long time, man. Like, you, you, you can't even people. People that were around during this person's life are dead now, is the point, you know? It definitely wasn't Bush. No. Definitely wasn't no. Reagan, you know? No. And I feel, I think Reagan wanted to do the right thing. I really do. Um, but he got he got sucked into the, the war on drugs and all the mm-hmm. other stuff the same, you know, like. Just say no. Just made so many mistakes, especially towards the end, you mm-hmm. know? 
but dude and even yeah he he totally does get propped up as this sort of like savior of the republican party now and he almost has a similar cult of personality about him like lincoln does to some people which is so misguided you know and you want to talk about we just i don't know if you saw the episode but i had um Uh, a woman on she's a professor uh in utah but we talked a lot about the constitution one of the questions she asked is is the president a constitutional dictator and then we had this conversation at large about like executive power and different presidents right you know and 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 her her answer to 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 shorten it is no we don't have a constitutional dictator that's not the role of the president because we have checks and balances but if you look at certain presidents right Lincoln during the Civil War maybe you could justify his decisions of I'm going to act and then ask for forgiveness later with some of the war powers that he took right when the liberties he took with the Constitution and his interpretation of them FDR definitely was like you know what oh yeah this is I'm gonna fucking do this no matter what right and then Obama's MO was well if Congress won't act then I'm going to right sort of taking yeah. on the role of now the legislative and the judicial branch as the executive branch and just saying I'm just gonna fucking do these things because more and more as you you go on you you see like these executive orders like how many did I mean, Trump did the same thing all these crazy this crazy number number of executive orders Biden these crazy number of executive orders like these yeah. aren't edicts you're not King John you know this isn't no one's gonna you know we're not gonna walk into your office with a new Magna Carta you know like it's just it's crazy like well, like kind of I mean it the belief of most Americans I think they, they will listen to the language the leader of the free world is what we call mm-hmm. the president mm-hmm. I mean if, if that's not if that doesn't bother you when right. people call Congress people and our president the leaders of our country, yeah. it's like you mean the representatives of our people, right? Or like, and, and 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 you know, and it's it's easy. I know everybody knows the history, but like you go back to 1913 and you break the seal, the the veil between the the individual person and the federal government, and mm-hmm. you start sending all your money to Washington, mm-hmm. and and then money is power, and that's where we start going downhill super quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you get rid of states' rights, you get rid of all this other stuff. And now people, I mean, we've got some people so ignorant that, like, there's like a, an actual movement of people trying to get rid of the Electoral College because they think I that a mob ruled straight democracy is, is somehow a good thing. And how many times do people say democracy? Like, stop yep. saying democracy. It's not yes. what you think it is. No, dude. Like, and it's so funny, too, because. This isn't just new. This isn't like a new idea. This is some 20th, 20th century ideological idea about democracy not being a good idea. Like the Greeks wrote about why total democracy was a bad thing, you know? Yep. And you get – you wind up with mob rule. And And to be fair, right, like the system we have isn't perfect by any means, but it's not mobocracy like what a total democracy is and like, you know – I think that the people that want to see the removal of the electoral college don't understand or frankly don't – maybe some of them don't understand and then some of them know that the system needs to be fixed and their 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 only answer is just to throw the baby out with the bathwater rather than trying to find a way to fix the problems because obviously the country is totally different now than when it was when the electoral college was established and you know you 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 should be looking at some of these things and asking how we need to tweak them as we evolve as a country but to say like oh well this entire thing just needs to get fucking wrecked like you have you ever asked somebody and I, and I have somebody who thinks that way and then ask them what the solution is they well, don't like, have yeah. one well all their solutions are they they, they are Popular under the vote. misimpression that their individual vote for president is an actual vote for president Mm-hmm. They don't understand how the system actually is not like that. And, and technically, until like most states have laws, like they, they've all established laws against it. And there's there's like the the everything or nothing, all or nothing states. And some there's still a couple states that can split their uh, the electoral college votes. States can do whatever they want with them. And yeah. all that, yeah. But like technically, an entire state could vote for one person for president. When you go to the 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 fake you know ballot box and and mm-hmm. fake vote for president, and the electoral college could turn around. And vote for the other person. Hundred percent. Like that's how it works. Mm-hmm. And so, like, and, and the, the states are, are, you know, deal with that on their own. But you're not actually voting for president. No. We're, we're never supposed to vote for president. Mm-hmm. Like that's not how it's set up. So, like, and and it, and it worked for a long time. It's just, but but now, like, there's there's so few barriers between 
our tax dollars going straight to the federal government, the president with their executive powers that started like I think in the 90s where they started even all the, the line item vetoes and all the executive powers that kept growing and growing and growing. You know, and you, you mentioned Lincoln, and you go all the way back who doubled the size of the federal government at least during Lincoln's tenure, and FDR blew the whole thing up all over again. Oh, yeah. And, and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, and people are not learning about how the country is actually set up. Mm -hmm. They think democracy is some kind of like, you know, they've all been psyoped into thinking that democracy is the greatest thing in the, in the world, uh, you know, um, and, well, and it, straight democracy. They don't understand that democracy at scale is terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't scale it. And that's another thing that people don't understand, too, is that we used to have levels to government in this country. And you'll hear people like Joe Rogan talk about it, like, I wouldn't want to be president because that's the hardest job in the world. No, it's, it's not supposed to be the hardest job in the world. Mm -hmm. you're, you're supposed to do very, very few things mm -hmm. uh, at that level. And, and, and if the system works right, at your local level, you could actually be pretty socialist. And yeah. that would be okay. That would still be pretty American as long as you're not, you know, taking away any of the constitutional rights for individuals that are guaranteed. Mm -hmm. um, but like those are the reason it's supposed to happen like that is when a, a community decides to implement these, uh, you know, these ideas, they actually pay the price for it as well mm -hmm. instead of the entire country coming in and bailing them out for, for being socialists and, and destroying their economy. Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of. I think that's a great point when you consider it because that's why the states are supposed to have more power in that aspect because what happens in one state shouldn't affect so much the rest of the country so much, you know, that shouldn't happen. These things that happen, they're, they're happening in these silos that are going on in Oklahoma or California or Kansas or wherever, you know, and that's what's supposed to the way it's supposed to be. And to your point, like when you say people don't understand what democracy means, there's these hot words like democracy now, right? It means whatever in this person's mind they think it means. Whatever they want the government to do for them, that's democracy, right? Yeah. It, it's whatever, oh, man, trans rights, that's democracy. Abortion, that's democracy. Like it's like, no, you, you, you fundamentally on first principles don't understand what democracy means when it just is now a a fucking word that it's it's meaning honestly it's meaningless it gets used so much you know it, no one could define it. it it is whatever it is somebody wants it to be in whatever way they want the government to exact uh, you know authority over the other half of the country that's what democracy is now yep yeah yep We've all been, you know, it's all the language stuff too. The, 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 my big thing is language. Like freedom and democracy is, is an interchangeable thing now. Mm -hmm. And it's not supposed to be. No. And I, and I, I, I for a long time, I, I used to be like, I think most people are smart. And I just don't think that anymore. And it's, it's not, it's right. not always their fault, but our education system is, is broken. You know, like mm -hmm. all, all these things, like it's, and it's hard not to get conspiratorial about these things when you see how our country has progressed over time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the way that the federal government has spent their money and the things they, they actively go after, you know, like it, it all keeps moving in a single direction. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's hard not to think that it's, it's on purpose sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the dumbing down of the American person is, is an intentional thing. Um, you know, there's a whole slew of conspiracy theories you could get into about how that happens, you know, all the way down to chemtrails and food, you know, and, um, but I do think that, um, Americans don't have the ability to think critically anymore. I think that this is a, this is a symptom of a apex society that has so much luxury that they don't think about actual things that matter anymore. The things that matter now are creature comforts and entertainment um, you know, and obviously the phone, the cell phone has totally eradicated people's attention span. You know, you have this, this piece of technology right here. You can find everything we're talking about on it right now on there. Right. But the algorithm, okay. Is why you live in an echo chamber, you know, and w which is also why uh, one of the interesting things I think about. Um, with AI is trying to there there's groups of people trying to solve the problem of the algorithm you know what what should an algorithm look like you know when people consume um, you know but it is this is I, I often wonder you know what what did the average Roman think 
when they sat around and they said, Gracchus, why are the plebes so angry? You know, not that they were British, but, you know, but like what sorts of conversations they were, in the movies, they were in right? The Charlton movies Heston, like you know, yeah, 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 exactly. And it is, it's so true, dude. Um, but um, what sorts of conversations did the Romans have? You know, did they know that they were a society in collapse? Like did the, the outer Romans in in Gaul know before the Romans that lived closer to the heart, you know, the same way that you, you could say that like Americans that are sort of now the um, isolated Americans, the blue collar worker, know that the society is collapsing before the white collar worker in San Francisco knows because things are that good there, right? Is you know, what – where are the parallels and measurables here that an apex society can recognize that it's collapsing to avoid it? And is avoidance even a possibility, right? It would take a lot. Um, well, I, th- I think one of the reasons that the, the phone, the algorithms, the AI, all that stuff has to be hijacked is you see these moments of brilliance where the American people do start to wake up, mm-hmm. where they start to realize that, that they, 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 we all have a lot more in common. Then we do differences. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that we all want the same things. That that you know maybe the federal government is not looking out for our best interests. Mm-hmm. You know maybe then maybe they're a bunch of liars. Maybe maybe I shouldn't be paying this much in taxes. Mm-hmm. You know, and then there's inconvenient facts about who pays how much taxes and all that other stuff. Um, and and I, and I think that's that's, like that. that's the real danger, right? Mm-hmm. Is is that is that we all start to figure out that you know what freedom actually is. And how we got here as a country, and um, that's why we can't have that stuff, mm-hmm. you know. But I, I think the Romans did know. There, there were definitely Romans that saw it coming, mm-hmm. you know. But it was a minority of people, right? And at mm-hmm. a certain point, once you buy the lie, the idea of Rome being a permanent thing, mm-hmm. then then what are you supposed to do about it? Yeah, right? that this is Rome. This is you know the greatest civilization that's ever been on the earth. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, we're the greatest thing that ever happened. We are the superpower. Mm-hmm. We are the superpower. The superpower. Nobody can touch us, right? right. Like, the, the, there's nothing we need to do. Like, we are the 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 the, the masters of all that we can see. Mm-hmm. How could we possibly collapse? And yeah. I think that's that's where we found ourselves. I think that this is it's total complacency to your point, and it's people going back to what we were talking about before. How there were generations of Americans who put all this trust in the American government and sort of took their hands off the wheel because they bought into the belief that all of our American interests align with whatever the government is doing and we trust them. I mean, have you seen, um, you've seen that show Stranger Things? Yeah. You remember at the, the first season, kind of near the end, where the people from like the lab are coming around and they're like looking for the kids and the dad, Mike's dad, like it is – kind of arguing with his mom and he's like, well, well, honey, I think we should trust these people. They're from the government, you know, and he has this fucking cold war mentality. You know what I mean? We're winning the cold war, the Russia, the Soviets are collapsing, you know, so I have all this trust in the American government. It's exactly what it is, man. You, you, you took the hand, your hand off the wheel because you trust the driver, you know, too much. And that's what happened. Yeah. Well, I think the greatest lie that people believe now is there are good politicians and bad politicians in Washington. Facts. You know, I, we, we all know that politicians, if we talk about politicians in a very general sense, mm-hmm. politicians are corrupt. Mm-hmm. Uh, politicians are looking out for themselves. Mm-hmm. The, all of our media is actually pretty honest about this. You'll find a lot of honest media about corrupt politicians and all this other stuff. Like for, for all the, the, the things that I was talking about where they, they are, you know, psyoping you in certain ways, mm-hmm. there's also a lot of honesty that we also ignore. Uh, yeah. Because we want to believe that our team, because we're tribal, is is the good yep. team. No, no, no. no my, my politicians wouldn't be that way. And even if they were, at least they're looking out for my best interests, mm-hmm. which is there's there's a dangerous blend of of, of narcissism and tribalism that that's going on, where we want to believe uh, that half the politicians are looking out for us in Washington, which is just not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that that's one of the big lies that that people believe, and the reason we want to believe it is, like you said, we are comfortable. We are comfortable being where we're at. It's it's easy these days too. Like one of the, the the things that really bothers me is, you know, the the what's more scary to me than uh, troops getting spit on after Vietnam 
which I, I don't, I'm glad I didn't have to go through that. Don't get me wrong. I didn't want to get spit on coming off the plane after a deployment. Mm -hmm. But the more terrifying thing to me is when you come home and the worship status of, mm -hmm. of veterans. Um, I'm, I, to me, I just, it always made me super uncomfortable. It's like, what, what, what is happening? Yeah. Why, why, why are we holding up? Why are you using me to hold up this, this, this institution, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this part of the government that is also, I know I'm a part of it, uh, also very corrupt and, right. and mismanaged and, and a giant, uh, you know, shit show. So, uh, that like the, these little things that, that have always bothered me like that, that echoed to me that the greatest generation stuff, which leads an entire generation of people, you know, like, Oh, I know a veteran and veterans are heroes and all veterans are heroes. All these people went to, to war for us just to fight for our freedoms. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, like, therefore, like if I vote, for this guy who is a veteran or, or our country is great or blah, 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 whatever it leads to, it always leads to bigger government. And for us to believe uh, that, that the role of the United States of America is not to protect the individual rights and liberties of Americans. Instead, it is to do something else that is, you know, something imperial. Mm -hmm. Dude, it's so funny because it's almost like the government is stolen valor, dude. You know, yeah. they've, they've co-opted whatever this idea of what veterans are and it's sort of, like you said, using this valor or goodness that people espouse to veterans and using it for themselves, essentially. You know what I mean? And um, I say this all the time, dude. Like, just because somebody is a veteran doesn't mean they're a good person, like, at all, you know? Especially as politicians. Like, who cares that Dan Crenshaw was a fucking you know, Navy oh. veteran, like who gives a fuck, you know, clearly like whatever ideals you think that he's supposed to represent as a veteran, he does not uphold like him and fucking Nancy Pelosi should write a book together on stock, the stock market and insider trading. You know, it's just so Man, you know, he's just smarter than us. He went to Harvard, right? Which is a, got a, one a, eye. a fine institution of, of higher learning. Absolutely. You know, no, it's just, it is, dude. Uh, there are, I think a lot of these things you're talking about that are poison to us as people, as like American citizens, I think are are here permanently. And it's funny because they're not held up by anything other than people holding them up because they have nothing else to think about or cling to, right? Because they almost don't know how to think anymore, I think. Um, and there is a problem with like the education system. Like no one knows about civics. Like, you know, you almost have to, you just have to almost have to go to fucking college or check a book out of the library now to even like hear anything about civics. You know, if you're going to go to, I'm going to go to college for civics and political science. You know what I mean? Even then you're going to walk out brainwashed because you're going to get some fucking liberal professor whose parents were a part of the weather underground in the 1960s, you know, who raised them to be communists and, you know, kept their victory garden going for the past 40 years and they're vegan and all this other crazy shit, you know. But anyway, uh, I think that the solution is um, doing what you were talking about and trying to get out there and get to know your neighbor and humanize one another again and get to build enough rapport and prove enough that we're the same people in a lot of ways by – behavior and conversations and um you know building relationships through doing things for one another whether it's cutting the grass or it's bringing over food when somebody's sick or in the hospital and just humanizing one another again it's not the government that's going to do that for you it's going to be you doing that for you and you doing that for everybody else that's the solution is is you you are and it goes back to that whole thing like the American people are the American government and that's the way it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be what it is now. Well, I think the American people are above and, and, and the list of priorities. Mm -hmm. The individual American is above the American government. Absolutely. Not, you know, like, and I, I think one of the problems is, is this, this narcissism where we attach ourselves to the federal government for all of our wants and needs. Right. You know, if you're not going to worship God, if you're you know, like we're we're allowed to worship everything except for anything that's greater than the federal government, mm -hmm. uh, but, but the but the rights of the individual, like you, if you take me, like God, family, individual rights, like mm -hmm. that's those are the things that are that fall way above the the federal government. And if you're not going to worship God, that's fine, whatever. But like you need to have something that 
exist beyond the, the, the scope of the government okay. as, as something that is valuable to you. That's something that you are willing to push back uh, for. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I think that's one of the big problems right now is we're, we're looking at the, at the government as the, the giver of the comfort that we so enjoy, mm-hmm. which is incorrect. I think that you said something earlier that I thought was um, really interesting. Uh, and you talked about like one half of us are risk taker, more risk takers than the other half. And, um, it's, uh, there's, there's a conversation I have with somebody, I don't remember who, and it was on this podcast, essentially about why people now, like younger adults are more willing to give in to more government control and authoritarianism is because they did not take enough risks as kids and that they were too coddled as children. And that because of that, they essentially the government acts in loco parentis to these people because they didn't learn self-reliance. They didn't learn how to do it on their own. So they weren't exposed to the level of risk that maybe you were or I was who was forced to play outside every day during the summer, right? And there's not this and, – and, and insert technology too and the codependence on that, right? Obviously. But that there is a inherent connection between – not taking risks as a kid and developing these these skills when you're problem solving with your friends three blocks away from the house without mom and dad, which is what you wanted, by the way, when you were in fifth and sixth grade, right, playing down the road. But you're problem solving with your friends. You're learning how to think for yourself away from those safety nets, right, that that doesn't happen anymore. And that what that is is these are the adults now. These are the iPad kids grown up. And they are totally okay with the government operating in local parentis for them because they just get to shove off the difficult shit and go right back to Netflix and, you know, TikTok. Yeah. Well, if, if I was going to give a young person advice, the only thing I would say is, is don't, don't believe in checking boxes. You know, like that's such a, you know, like I don't. That, that song like don't but you know don't let your your babies grow up to be cowboys mm-hmm. is is the worst thing you can listen to these days you right. know make them be doctors and lawyers and such like absolutely not not anymore um if, if you're a young person uh and people are trying to force you to graduate high school and then to go to college and then to get a job don't mm-hmm. don't do those things do something else go out there and get hungry yeah and like literally get hungry at some point in your life mm-hmm. it, it's so good for you Go out there and take some risks. Go out there and try to start a business. Mm-hmm. Like th- these things are not going to end your life. Um, uh, and, and that those those are the, the real growth moments. And, and those are the places where you're going to find out uh, just uh, how unwilling uh, the government is to let you do whatever it is that you want to do, even if you're not hurting somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, but the, that, that's one of the, the big problems with our society, right? Like you said, you're always attached to something. You're attached to the checklist to a good job you're attached to the you know the, right. the, the machines that you're you were relying on uh, which is attached to the grid which we all think that the government you know is in control of the grid and all these other things and uh, we, we, we conglomerate the the federal government into the, like the goodness but also like just forgive it for all of its badness but like mm-hmm. young people you need to get out there don't listen to your teachers um, you know high school teachers high school uh, guidance counselors uh, the, the vast majority of them um, didn't want to do that when they were growing up. They are a pile of broken dreams that are trying to push their failed dreams and ideology onto you. Mm-hmm. And that's not going to make you happy. Right. I mean, this is a, a lesson. There's so many different ways that you could just take that and, and imprint it as a lesson for everything, man. Like, it's okay to fail, right? It's okay yeah. to take risks and and you're learning how to recover from those things. You know, how many how many freaking cliches can you come up with, right? Like a smooth, smooth seas never made a good sailor or all this stupid shit. But like, yeah. it's true though, you know, like you have to go out, you have to, a, a free society is inherently risky in a lot of different ways. You know, you think of, for all of the faults of, of settling the West, right? That spirit, that American spirit of, you know, uh, westward expansion, is is dead there's not 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 to the way it used to be there are people who are interested in that sort of thing in the way that you can be now in our modern age you know say what you want about them but like people like elon musk right who wasn't born an american but the people the risk takers in that that aspect you know that sort of 
I almost, dude, it's almost like this. It's so easy to say somebody else can do this for me now, you know, and you, you kind of just people operate their lives that way because again, we live in such a good society, right? Good society that you go to the grocery store, you can guarantee there's going to be food there. You go to the kitchen, you guarantee you can turn your faucet on and there's water. You go to the bathroom and you can guarantee the lights, you know, the light's going to come on and the toilet's going to flush, you know? It's just all of these things where it's like this actually is not real life. This is an this is a facade we've created because real life is so harsh, you know, that we are doing everything to avoid the realities of life. You know, that's what this stuff is. Well, I mean, at the very least you can do is recognize it and take advantage of it. It's just difficult. But I, I do want to ask you one more question. Okay. What what do you think the American dream is? Mm-hmm. I think that the American dream is living in a society where you have, first off, you have the opportunity everybody else does, meaning that you can go and try just like everybody else can go and try. It doesn't mean that you're going to succeed, right? And that uh, the American dream also means that um, you understand that as an American, you have a certain level of responsibility to adhere to the ideals of individual freedom and that means to take responsibility for your life and understanding that that is a privilege not everybody gets to enjoy in the world is is being able to take over responsibility for your life and take your life in your own hands that that is the american dream and that you have the ability to build a life based on your effort and what you put into it is what you may get out of it, knowing you may get out of it, not necessarily what you always will get out of it, but that you are always afforded the opportunity to try to make your life better and to understand too that it is your duty to establish the common good with everybody else and helping everybody achieve that sort of same and maintain that same level of individual sovereignty um, by supporting and being good neighbor and good, you know, brotherhood, the brotherhood of man, right, so to speak, um, and understanding that that's what freedom actually means. Freedom doesn't mean equity and that you're, everybody's get, is going to succeed and that everybody's going to have the same starting point because that's not real, right? Um, the American dream is just essentially having the opportunity to create whatever you want for your life, Um but understanding, too, that that means that you have to take risks and that the responsibility is solely yours and that that is actually a privilege and it's not something to shy away from, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, like we said about equity, too, it's like a, the rights are not things or services. Right. Rights are rights. Rights are, are, are your, your, the key to unlimited growth potential. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and whether that potential is realized or not. That's part of life. You know, that's America. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Yeah, man. No, a absolutely. What you said, dude, like, um, I'll wrap up with this, like, about, about equity, man. Like, it's, there's no such thing as equity in life naturally. It's It's a fabrication. You're never, if you think that equity can exist naturally, you don't understand the human nature at all, right? You don't. So we're not all born the same. We don't all think the same way. We don't all have the same happenstances and chances in our life that everybody else does. We don't all get put in front of the same people. There's so many different nuances and random things in our life that either put you ahead. I mean, just think of the, the whole, like, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Not everybody has the opportunity to meet somebody who can elevate your life x three times you know what i mean it just doesn't always happen dude it's just the randomness of this life dude that's it and that's the great the greatest thing you could ever hope for is to be able to try and not have to conform yep well thanks dude yeah. this was this conversation was all over the fucking place dude we we started talking about some crazy shit with injured cold and mothman and pretty much just solved the american crisis with uh you know being a good person 
and uh, I think we did. We yeah. did. Everybody should listen to this podcast. <laughs> they should. Tra- sorry, I just I had to ask the JFK question. It's no, my fault. I'm no. You don't have to say you're sorry, dude. I like that question, <laughs> and I'm sorry that if uh, you came on totally expecting to just start with that, and then I fucking took you down this crazy weird rabbit hole of Mothman and injured cold and aliens you know which was a good fun I like conversation i did too that was that's radical. what i like when you come on you should come on more often even if it's just you co-hosting episodes with me i think that would be cool and uh i think it'd be a good time i mean my co-host is deployed right now so if you oh, what uh, a piece of crap it i sounds know like dude. he's just taking a vacation with his boys that's what it sounds like to that's me that's all it is dude that's what those <sighs> that's what those odas do man they just go out there and it's just nothing but but rip it and throwing grenades into the river, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> that was my second yeah, deployment. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, do we'll, uh, plug plug where we can find you, Trent, and uh, we'll close up. Yeah, uh, Instagram, X, uh, just at one's ready, one's ready dot com. Uh, if you want to follow me personally, I think I'm under Trent Segmiller on Instagram. I'm way less in- interesting than the one's ready page, but yeah, um, I it's think a good time. It's a good time. Thank you. Yeah, man. I'll, I'll come back anytime. I'm retired. So. You are. Yep. No, I mean, I, I would have no problem if you were co-hosting with me for a couple months. That'd be pretty dope. But um, Let's bring some people on. We should. Well, I got. I already got people coming on. You know what? I'll just send you. I'll just send you my list of friends that's coming on, coming up. And send we'll me do the schedule. It. I will send could. you this, this, this schedule. It's a good one. Are they one. always on uh, communist time, though? Yeah, for the most part. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You know, this is this is what happens when I live across enemy lines. It's just one wow. of these things that happens, unfortunately. But I'm just uh, saying, yeah. Texas is not so bad, brother. Yeah, we I had Todd Todd Spears on, and he says that uh, Central Time is God's time. That's what he says. Exactly. If you want to adopt that, like I ado- adopted your Hotem thing, I like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Finally well, getting like, over Hotem. I was so happy. I flew into Detroit the other day. I was on my way to DC for a retirement a ceremony. And I found out. Detroit is in Eastern time. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, good. Yes. At least they're not in central time. Thank goodness. Oh, that's weird. My parents you, you don't in Florida think... are in central time. Did you know that? Yeah. But it's, it's weird to think about that. Like, cause the, the Eastern coast, as it like flails out that way, we mm-hmm. all tend to think like I would, you know, in my brain, Michigan is due North of mm-hmm. San Antonio, but it's not, no. it's like way East. Right. I know. I think we have this like, idea that like everything is sort of just stacked on top of each other evenly and it's just yeah. not like i said like if i i tell people my parents live in the panhandle of florida and they are in central time and they're like how the fuck are your parents in florida and on central time it's like look at a map dude go look at a yeah, map the, the amount of east west that the east coast goes right on that angle is yeah. uh i think we underestimate it we we do that's something the european mind just cannot comprehend <laughs> the size of the united states well, everybody, we go. thank you so much for listening to another episode. This was a good one. I enjoyed it, Trent. Thank you again for coming on. And uh, make sure you check out our sponsors in the show notes, Kill Cliff, Protect, Skull and Crossbeans Coffee, Redefine Violence, and The Light Sleeper. You can find the codes for discounts on all those lovely products. And um, thank you guys for hanging out again for another episode of I Came With Fire podcast. Appreciate it, brother.